Okay then. Hello and welcome to episode 103 of Question and Answer. I am your host, Panyo Basa. And before I commence to answering questions, well, I'm just fixing to start commencing, I would like to share with you that after being pestered by my sweet, darling, beloved woman to get my DNA tested, I got my DNA tested so, so that I can have some understanding of my ancestry or a better understanding of my ancestry, I should say. And it turns out, not really a big surprise, that I'm 64% English, 16% Scottish, 6% Welsh, 4% Irish, and 10% Continental Germanic. So, yeah, I'm pretty much 100% Northwestern European. Uh, so, I got the beverage right here which is actually coffee. And I got the emergency backup beverage. And I still got the pond water that I haven't drunk yet. So if I really get desperate, I can drink that. And so I'm just gonna start commencing. Well, I'm just gonna start answering questions. Forget the commencing, we're just gonna dive right in. And the first question is from Buddhist Folk Assembly Huen. And he changes his name every few weeks. I mean, you probably know him by other names, but now his name is Buddhist Folk Assembly Huen. And his first question is, assuming that free will is incompatible with Buddhism, how is it possible that karma is intention or is driven by intention? In other words, what is intention if not free will? Where does intention come from? Well, free will is incompatible with logic in addition to being incompatible with Buddhism. I mean, this going with classical logic, it is impossible. So if free will somehow exists, it's a kind of paradox or miracle or some such, which may be the case. But also in order to have free will, you have to have a self. You have to have some kind of like separated individuality that is making the decisions, not like some web of causes and effects that are resulting in these decisions being made. So anyways, with that as a kind of unnecessary preamble, I'll uh, get actually to the question here. See, assuming that free will is incompatible with Buddhism, how is it possible that karma is intention or is driven by intention? In other words, what is intention if not free will? Where does intention arise from? Well, I mean, why does intention have to be free? You know, it's like the Buddha's second formal discourse after his enlightenment, according to tradition, is the Anatta Lakana Sutta, and he says, we cannot say with any of the five commas, which includes will or intention, we cannot say, let it be this way, let it not be that way, and have it reliably happen. We do not have complete control over any of our, any of our khandas, any of the aggregates that constitute a human being. That includes our body, and all the aspects of our mind. We do not have complete control over that. Not even a fully enlightened being does. And so, I mean, if it's not free will, it's just will. It's conditioned will. And really, I mean, <laughs> intention is not a very good translation of chedana, which is what karma is identified as in the texts. So it's better just to call it will, you know, like in the Schopenhauerian sense, or it's like the the momentum of your mental states. So you can uh, do with that as you will, but I mean, it's, it certainly doesn't have to be free. I mean, in order to have will, will doesn't have to be free in order for it to be will. It's just like the motive force of your mental states. And that motive force is largely driven by this past momentum. So, you can, uh, you can make decisions, but these decisions are always going to have causes. So it's not strict determinism either, though. It's, it's weird in, in traditional Theravada Buddhism. Both extremes, I guess, of free will on the one hand and just determinism on the other are both 
dismissed. So it's like the middle path between free will and determinism is one of the many middle paths of Buddhism. So I hope I answered that question. So I'm just going to move on to Buddhist Folk Assembly Huen's next question, which is, who are your top three favorite Roman emperors? Or top five, if you prefer a longer list. Well, my top three favorites, first of all, the most interesting, the one that I wish had lasted longer and didn't die so soon, was Julian, or Julian the Apostate. He was, he was only emperor for like two years or something. He was the last pagan emperor. And he was trying to convert Rome away from Christianity, which was kind of gaining momentum in his time, and sort of set up uh, like a, a state paganism that had like higher levels based on Neoplatonism. And it is too bad that he only lasted about two years as emperor before he caught a spear while fighting the, the Persians. And there are many people who believe that that spear was thrown by a Christian Roman rather than a Persian soldier. Because, and one of the little bits of evidence for that is that the Persian king, the king of kings, the Shah, had uh, offered a, a reward to anybody who could uh, take out the Roman emperor and nobody claimed the reward. So, I mean... It could still have been a Persian spear that, that got him. So anyways, he's one of my favorites. The, the emperor that I consider to be the best, like the greatest emperor, emperor who led Rome to its peak of prosperity would be Trajan. Rome reached its maximum extent under Trajan. And he was one of the philosopher kings, the philosopher emperors, who was also a good general. So Julian... Trajan, and also one of the more interesting emperors who really saved the empire from destruction way back in the middle of the third century was Aurelian. So those, I guess, would be my three favorite Roman emperors would be Julian, Trajan, and Aurelian. So I don't think I'll extend it out to five because then I'll have to think too much trying to come up with two more. So those are my top three. And I'm just going to move on to the next question, which is from NPC6. And NPC6 says, with regard to um, some discussion on the previous Q&A, it seems like the most Buddhist thing to do would be to make sure your parents and partners sign legal documents determining their own medical end-of-life or not wishes. Wouldn't this place you in a karma-neutral position? And NPC6 is referring to, like, uh, do not resuscitate orders like in a person's will for example so in your will I, I got my first will made a few months ago and one of the questions when that the lawyer asked is I mean what do you want to do when like if you're like terminally ill or in a coma or you know you're just being kept alive by machines do you want to be kept alive by machines do you want to to have the doctors pull the plug, or do you want somebody else to decide? And so NPC6 here is saying that probably the wisest thing to do would be encourage like your parents, your aging parents, to make their decision there, whether they want the machine to stay plugged in or not, if they are like brain dead or some such being kept alive by a machine or in a like uh inevitably deteriorating terminal condition kind of a thing. So, yeah, I mean, it certainly would take the the burden off of the children of these aging parents because in, according to Buddhism, that one of the things that it will guarantee hell after you die is to kill one of your own parents. So, I mean, it's there's all these subtleties brought about by modern medicine and so forth that um, I mean there's certainly mitigating factors I mean there's a, a big difference between somebody whose parent is brain dead and they just say okay to unplug in the machine that's keeping their parent alive and like Lizzie Borden with her axe there's 
there's a big difference there. And I don't think that the end result of their actions is going to be the same necessarily. So, yeah, I mean, I would be very hesitant to uh, help one of my parents die. I mean, my mother was afraid of death and she would have wanted to stay alive no matter what, I think. My father, on the other hand, was not afraid of dying. And uh, in fact, he made a pact with one of his best friends that if they were really sick and they weren't getting better, they weren't going to get better, that if the other person asked for a pistol, then he would provide it. So they made this pact that if, you know, the person was just wiped out, you know, their body was totaled in automotive terms, that if, if one of them were to ask for a, pistol, a loaded pistol, to take care of it themselves, then, you know, the friend would provide this. And my father's friend was terminally ill in a hospital room. And my father admitted he was glad that he did not take him up on the offer or on the, on the pact and did not ask for the pistol. But with your parents, it's even a bigger deal, especially according to uh, traditional Buddhism. So, yeah, I guess that would be the best thing to do is, you know, have your, your loved ones, especially older loved ones, have a will and make their own decision so that you do not have the burden of making the decision yourself, whether you're going to keep them alive as a vegetable or in misery or just have the machine unplugged, which might imperil your karmic prospects for your next life even though it might be done out of compassion and love and so forth. So I guess I'll just move on to the next question. This is from Jules. And Jules says, would you rather be electrocuted or eaten by a shark? And this is, I think this comes from a Trump speech where he's sort of joking about being on a boat and uh, there's sharks circling the boat and the boat's starting to sink and he doesn't know if the electronics on the boat would electrocute somebody. So he, he's, I think he much preferred to be electrocuted than eaten by a shark. And I have to admit, I mean, I think it might be kind of cool to be eaten by a tiger. You know, it's like if a tiger were to just jump out of the jungle at me when I was in Asia, I mean, there'd be alarm, I assume, but also it'd be cool, a tiger, you know? So, I mean, you'd be helping to feed an endangered animal and so forth. But sharks, I don't know. Just being eaten by sharks, just it doesn't seem nearly as cool as being eaten by a tiger. I mean, a tiger just kind of jumps on you and like, that crunches into the back of your neck and it's all over. You know, they're not, they're not playing around. Sharks, I think, would just be like taking chunks out of you until you're not alive anymore and then continue taking chunks out of you. So... Yeah, I think I'd rather be electrocuted. Not that I'm making any kind of requests here. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Raphael. And Raphael says, In one of your live streams in April, you said that you consider faith to be delusion because faith means you think that you know something that you don't really know. But how can you believe in rebirth and enlightenment when you don't have a proof for both of it? Well, there is a difference between believing something and just accepting something as a working hypothesis. I mean, we have to have some kind of hypotheses or beliefs or theories that we base our, our decisions on, for example. And so it's, it's like a belief, like firm faith, is you're just gripping something firmly, gripping this Swiss Army knife firmly. But if it's a working hypothesis, you're just kind of holding it in an open hand. You know, you're not insisting upon it. You're not obsessing over it. You know, you're not getting pissed off at people saying that, you know, this, this other theory is more correct or something. So it is good to have working hypotheses, but when it gets to the level of like firm belief, then you're kind of in trouble. Because it is true, I have said that faith is a kind of delusion because you think, or just belief is a delusion because you think you know something that you don't really know. And that's delusional. 
So you're better off with a certain amount of philosophical detachment and working with a hypothesis and, you know, being open-minded enough that if your hypothesis gets shot down or that some better hypothesis appears that you can adjust your approach to things accordingly. So I think I'll just move on to Raphael's next question, which is, did the Buddha ever say that certain people are like animals or worse? I have a colleague at work who is always talking about sex and making perverted jokes. I'm starting to think he's more like an animal driven by instinct than a human being. Well, the only passage in the Pali Tipitaka that I can remember where the Buddha is saying that some people are worse than animals or more foolish than animals is it's in the canonical history of the Second Council, which is in the, the Chulawaga of the Vinayapitaka. I think it's the last chapter of the Vinayapitaka or the, yeah, the Vinayapitaka and the Chulawaga of the Vinayapitaka in particular. And it's uh, with regard to monks who handle money. This monk who doesn't handle money, it's, it's kind of a long story. I guess I'm into long stories anyhow. So the, what caused the second council, according to traditional, like orthodox Theravada Buddhism, is you had a certain strict monk who was visiting a monastery that was further east, in, like, in, the, in the Ganges Valley. And the monks there were, I mean, this was just like, a hundred years after the, the passing of the Buddha, the Parinibbana of the Buddha, and they're already like asking for donations and like dividing up the money. The monks are all handling money and he tells them they shouldn't do that. In front of lay people, he's saying, no, this isn't right. You shouldn't be doing this. And so they punish him. You know, the, the, the money handling monks punish the good monk for like abusing them in front of lay people. It's, it's some, some kind of rule that they're bringing up against him and they force him to apologize. There's a formal act of the Sangha where they, they did it against him, sort of like lawfare. And those of you in America are familiar with that term, I assume. And so they make him go and apologize to these lay people that he was saying, you know, they shouldn't be offering money to monks. And so he starts quoting the words of the Buddha and one of these quotes from the Buddha that he quotes to these lay people is that the Buddha said that monks who handle money are more foolish than animals. They're enslaved to their own greed and they're surrounded by darkness. And so, of course, he just made things worse <laughs> and it, it caused, I mean, then they started really getting pissed off at him and wanting to really punish him. And then he just took off and it, it culminated in the second council. Um, let's see. So that's the only time in the text that I can think of, but I've often thought that it's sort of like, it's not like human beings are higher than animals, like, especially from an ethical point of view that, I mean, the most primitive life that has any kind of mind, you know, it's not down at the bottom. It's kind of right in the center. And then you've got like concentric rings going, you know, out spreading outwards. And so like, you've got like some bug or worm or something that's like this dot of consciousness. And then, you know, more advanced animals have a bigger circle, you know, like a, a dog will have this size of a circle. A human will have a bigger circle. Maybe some sort of deity will have a really big circle, but it's like good and bad. I mean, the best human is going to be better than the best dog. And the worst human is going to be worse than the worst dog. You know, they're, they're sort of at a higher level of consciousness. You know, they can think better. They have more reason than a dog as a general rule. But still, as, as I just said, the worst human, Pol Pot, is worse than the, the, the worst rabid dog. He caused way more suffering, way more misery than any rabid dog or any dog who has ever existed. So ethically, we are not necessarily above animals. That's, that's a matter of our own choice and like our own karma and so forth. So let's see. The colleague at work who's always talking about sex and making perverted jokes. Yeah, I'm not sure about him. I mean, he, he, there might be like it's balanced out by something else that you're not seeing. In which case, I mean, 
whether he's above or below the, the common Cocker Spaniel or not, I, I really can't say. But still, I mean, the, the best human is better than the best dog. The worst human is worse than the worst dog. So, and then the best dog is better than the best, I don't know, frog. And the worst dog is worse than the worst frog. You know, it's just as you go upwards in the, on the scale in the 31 planes of existence, in a way, it's kind of a faulty analogy or a model because you could think of it more as concentric rings. Like, like Mara, who is like the Buddhist devil, he's way up in a very high heaven realm. The highest, the highest heaven realm in the sensual realm, or the the, the Kama Loka. So, also, I mean, it reminds me of people like Osho, who may have really attained some kind of spiritual attainment, but nevertheless were like complete rascals anyway. So, I kind of answered that question. Did the Buddha ever say that certain people are like animals or worse? Yeah, again, the only example I can think of. I, there's probably more examples, but the only one that really comes to mind is in the the last chapter of the Chulavaga of, of the Vinaya Pitaka, where he's referring to monks who handle money. So, I mean, if monks who handle money are more foolish than animals, then what do you say about some guy who's making pervy jokes all the time and obsessed with sex? So, I'm just going to move on to Raphael's next question which is as follows. Let's see. Okay, which is as follows. I was just making sure that I answered the other two first. What is the most beneficial thing I can do with a Sait Padi or prayer beads, according to you? And I'm just impressed that Raphael knows the Burmese word for a mala or like a, a Burmese, a Buddhist rosary. And it's called a Sait Padi. And the most beneficial thing you can do with a Sait Padi, I assume the most beneficial thing from like a Dharmic point of view is just to be very mindful when you're working the beads. You know, be mindful of like the pressure of your thumb against the bead and the movement of your thumb as you're passing on to the next bead. Um, I actually asked for a, a mala, a rosary, Burmese or a Buddhist rosary once because I thought it would help me to keep stay awake when I was sleepy where you know just keeping my thumb moving my thumbs keeping them moving would kind of help to keep me awake although and I never was really much into uh, using rosaries so it was just a temporary experiment and didn't really come to much in my case but uh, the way the Burmese do it is they do the the reflections on the the qualities of buddha dhamma and sangha and that's you know, every time they do that it's one bead and there's 108 beads on a mala i'm pretty sure so they would do it like at least 108 times until they get back to the the big bead that tells you that you've done an entire circuit but i think more important than just repeating you know edp so bagawa uh etc is just being mindful that mindfulness of like the motions of your body and so forth um, is really a relatively advanced practice and will get you farther than contemplating ideas about the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, especially if it's just a rote formula that you're repeating pretty much like a mantra. There might be other techniques of using rosary beads that um, I'm not familiar with because I'm really didn't do it very much. I experimented with it a little bit, but it's really a big deal, especially for, for Burmese Buddhists, monks and lay people. Almost everybody that takes Buddhism seriously will have a mala or a Sait Padi. So I guess I kind of answered that question. So I'm moving on to Austin and I'm checking to make sure we really are recording. And yep, we certainly are almost certainly anyhow. So Austin says, It is said in the text that many people became enlightened simply by listening to the Buddha's words. Why then don't people become enlightened when they read these words today? If the reason is that their karma isn't ripe, why are there fewer ripe individuals in today's modern age? And I have had people explain this to me. Like, you read the, 
texts and there can be thousands tens of thousands of people all becoming enlightened or at least becoming arias just from listening to a sermon of the buddha and i had it explained to me that one reason for that is that before gotama buddha existed nobody could become enlightened because dhamma had disappeared from the world he had to rediscover dhamma so he had all these people that were ripe but they just couldn't become enlightened yet because there was no enlightened being to teach them like an enlightened philosophy enlightened dharma so that when the buddha came along you had all these people that were ripe for enlightenment that you know they heard the, they heard the words that they needed to hear and boop so that's like a traditional common explanation although also when you're in the presence of an enlightened being it's very different from just reading a book that when you're in, in the presence of an enlightened being, first of all, he's kind of reading into you. He knows what, he can like look into you and see what you need to hear, for example. But also, I mean, you're picking up on his higher vibration, if you will, like mental states are contagious. So if you're with a really wise person, you're going to be uplifted by that. You're with a fully enlightened person, you can be very uplifted by that, even if he doesn't say anything. Just, just through like sort of subliminal empathy or or telepathy or something so that's another possible reason why more people become enlightened <clears throat> um, from hearing an actual buddha talking you know they had really good karma just to be able to be there and you know the person who buys a book at a bookstore or plays a youtube video or something and doesn't become enlightened although it still apparently does happen that um you know, you can hear certain words or um, read certain words and it might be that you're really ripe for it. You hear exactly what you need to hear and it can still cause some kind of um, like a, a realization. So, and also another, another ex explanation for how so many people became enlightened in the Buddhist time is that it's just standard ancient Indian exaggeration and glorification of the Buddha. I mean, like, the, I read, like, the brief history of Mangala Buddha in a previous Q&A, and it was something like 10 trillion people all became enlightened listening to Mangala Buddha giving a, a, giving a sermon. And we can assume um, that that didn't really happen the way the book says it happened, to say the least. So there's another... <laughs> Another possibility, another possible explanation is that it's just like Indian religious hyperbole, exaggeration. So take your pick. You can, you can say A, B, C or none of the above with regard to that answer. And I'm just going to move on to Austin's next question, which is how much of the Pali canon do you believe contains historical truth as opposed to mythology. So I assume he's just referring to the narrative stuff. I mean, the philosophy, like a lot of the, the Buddhist philosophy and ethics and so forth, you know, it wouldn't really be historical truth or mythology. You know, it's just like abstract or just techniques for, for meditating and so forth. It wouldn't fit into either category. It wouldn't be historical truth or mythology. Um, unless by historical truth, you mean the Buddha really said it, but still, I mean, it's like there would be more than one option. I mean, you'd have a spectrum, you know, even if you include the Buddha's like philosophical teachings in this, you're going to have a spectrum of like verbatim, like word for word exactitude with regard to what he actually said on the one hand. And then you go through the spectrum of like, you know, rough paraphrase that nevertheless, he would agree with, you know, it was like saying what he said in somewhat different language and then stuff that he didn't say, but probably would still kind of endorse. And then you're getting into stuff that he wouldn't endorse. And then at the opposite extreme would be stuff that he would just vigorously denounce. And some of that has got into the text, I'm pretty sure. Especially if you include other schools of Buddhism that have deviated even farther. So... With regard to just the narrative stuff, though, just, you know, 
at one time the Buddha was, you know, in Sawati and Anatta Pindika's grove, and you know, and then he met with such and such person, and they, that kind of thing. I would guess probably less than ten percent. This is probably not a very popular uh, point of view for Buddhists. I did write an essay, which I don't think is on the internet right now. It's called "What Did the Buddha Really Teach?" and yeah, I think there's a good chance it's it's. 10% or less than 10% of what you read in the texts as being like historically, objectively, empirically accurate with regard to what the Buddha really did and what the Buddha really said. Like even the, the Vatican, I have read that the Vatican states, you know, like the official position, even though they don't advertise this, is that in the New Testament, only about 20% of the words attributed to Jesus were really spoken by Jesus. You know, like seminary schools will be teaching this stuff, even though the normies that go to church may not ever get an inkling of it. And the New Testament, I mean, it was written down, you know, within a century of the time of, of Jesus, most of it anyway. And it was in a culture like Greek and Jewish that, act, that already had like an objective sense of history and accurate record keeping and so forth. Whereas in India, things just get exaggerated and mythologized almost right off the bat. And they had much more of a surreal kind of understanding of reality than people of Europe or, you know, the, the Roman, early Roman Empire. And they had less concept of, like, historical accuracy because they really didn't have much of a sense of history other than just chronicles and legends and so forth. You know, I've, I've read that the British actually invented Indian history when, when they colonized India, that it didn't really exist before then other than just chronicles and so forth, that, um, you know, they just mix legends and mythology and fact all together, sort of like, like Herodotus, the father of Western history, that India never really got much farther than that until the British came along. So... Yeah, I would say 10% would be a pretty safe bet. Maybe somewhat less than 10% even. But, I mean, a lot of it is like standard stuff. It's like different schools of Buddhism would have the same sermons, the same suttas spoken in different places, different monasteries. So we may assume that the Theravadins, because there's more suttas delivered at Sawati, that that was sort of a stronghold for the Theravadins. Other schools of Buddhism had different places geographically, and more of the Buddhist sermons are located there rather than in Sawati, for example. And just a lot of the speeches, you know, it's just like this formula that like real human beings just don't speak that way. So, yeah, I'm just giving a really long meandering answer when my guess is approximately 10% or no more than 10%. Let's just play it safe and say no more than 15% of the narratives in the Pali Canon are likely to be historical fact, that stuff that really objectively empirically happened. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Blondie. And Blondie says, I would like to hear your thoughts on this. The way I penetrate the Four Noble Truths is heretical. It seems to me that there is suffering, but there is also joy. And the causes for suffering are the same as the causes for ordinary happiness, like getting married, for example. Even though ultimately you will get old and die and nothing is permanent, conditioned phenomena can also be a lot of fun while they last. And I have thought about this sort of thing, too. I'm a, I'm a fellow heretic, I guess. But there is a, an argument that everything is dukkha. I mean, it's, the first noble truth is dukkha. And... Also, dukkha is one of the three marks of or the three marks of existence. That one of the tilakana is sabe sankara dukkha. All conditioned things are conducive to suffering or unsatisfying. And one of the arguments is everything is dukkha because it's impermanent. 
But I mean, you could just twist that around the other way and say everything is like all suffering. It, like some people say, even happiness is dukkha because it doesn't last. But you could just turn it around and say, even even unhappiness is happiness because it doesn't last. So it's not a very strong argument to just rely on impermanence. But <clears throat> there is more subtlety to it. I mean, at the superficial level. You could say it all balances out. And I, I agree with this, that happiness and unhappiness balance out in the long run. But there's a deeper level of just sort of, just a kind of deep, pretty much subliminal dissatisfaction. There's this restless dissatisfaction. Some of the very early texts refer to it as a kind of barb or dart that's stuck in your heart that causes you to just run around in all directions. And so even... When you've got something really good, your favorite kind of ice cream, for example, there's still a certain amount of dissatisfaction. You want more. Or then you start getting like this little bit of subliminal worry, like you're running out. I mean, you're eating it all. And you, you, you know, it's going away. It's disappearing. This source of my happiness is dwindling away in the bowl in front of me. And you can't just keep it because it'll melt. And... It's just like this restless dissatisfaction at a, a very deep fundamental level that causes even happiness not to be pure happiness. So there's always this kind of a vague unease that pervades human existence. And in a way, it's kind of what is pushing us forwards through life. It's, it's like this vague dissatisfaction, this restlessness that is pushing us through life because if we ever became fully satisfied with anything it was like it like time would stop we just stop moving forwards we'd just be sat completely satisfied and just stop which is kind of what enlightenment is after especially parinibbana when you die then that's it you, you stop you're not you, you no longer have this restless dissatisfaction the thorn has been pulled out of your heart the burden has been laid down So at one level, I do agree with Blondie that positive and negative have to balance out in the long run. And I mean, it's more a matter of, do you want like smooth sailing of neutrality or do you want a roller coaster ride of ecstasy, misery, ecstasy, misery? Like if you've ever been 18 years old and madly in love, you know what the roller coaster ride is like, ecstasy, misery, ecstasy, misery. And, you know, it all balances out to the same zero. All the positives and negatives balance out to the same zero. But still, at this deeper level, you have the restless dissatisfaction that is just driving us through life. And that is, everything is dukkha. So, I hope I kind of answered that question. Because I'm moving on to Blondie's second question here, which is, why doesn't Buddhism even have a marriage ritual? It seems strange for a religion. And yes, it is strange for a religion. And Buddhism really didn't start out as a religion. It started off as a kind of philosophical renunciation. But, I mean, the earliest Buddhists were monks. They were renunciants. They went off into the forest and meditated. You know, they strove for enlightenment in this very life. And marriage has nothing to do with that. So... It's, uh, it's actually a very s severe infraction of the rules. It is a serious transgression for a monk to even participate in a marriage ceremony. Like um, in the Zen, like some Mahayana Buddhism, you'll have priests who are conducting Buddhist marriages. Obviously, in other religions like Christianity and Judaism, you've got the priest or the rabbi or whoever who is conducting this sacrament of marriage between two people but in buddhism i mean like mating and so forth is it involves really strong attachment which the second noble truth or yeah the second noble truth it's like all suffering is caused by craving and attachment and by getting into a romantic relationship with a, a woman or a man if you happen to be a woman it involves the roller coaster ride to some degree and lots of attachment lots of desires and it is a distraction from enlightenment and so 
since Buddhism is designed to help people get enlightened, it's just marriage is just a secular thing. It's just a cultural thing that doesn't have anything to do with the highest Dhamma. And monks are not allowed to participate. So let's see. Yeah, it's, Buddhism became a popular religion, sort of the way Christianity did. I mean, even early Christianity was sort of a renunciant movement. You know, sell all that you have, give the money to the poor, and take up your cross, you know. And when it becomes popular, most people are normies, and they, they're just not in a position to do that, and so they don't. And um, so the Eek sort of got priests and like conducting marriage ceremonies in Christianity, which wasn't the case probably in very early Christianity. And uh, in Buddhism, it was just so obviously, I mean, it's just right there. It's one of the Sangha de Sesa rules that a monk is just not allowed to act as any kind of go-between. He's not supposed to encourage people to get married in any way. Unless, I mean, if they're, if they're already married and just kind of estranged, they're separated, he can encourage them to reconcile, but he cannot encourage anybody to get together and form like a romantic pair bond. That is a serious offense, and he's got to do penance for six days and six nights for having done such a thing. So, <clears throat> most religion, it's mainly for the purpose of giving a kind of stability to uh, society. But Buddhism really wasn't designed for that. It was a renunciation of society. And now that it's, it has been kind of dragged back into society as a kind of social institution, still, like in Burma, if two people get married, they just go to the village headman and sign papers, and then they're married. And then after that, then they'll go to the monastery and offer food to the monks and get blessed after they've already done it. So, yeah, it might be strange for a religion, but Buddhism wasn't originally intended to be so much of a religion as just like a, a very radical philosophical movement, which then turned into a religion. And uh, fortunately, it didn't mutate so wildly that all of a sudden it's okay for monks to commit Sangha de Sesa offenses. So I'll just move on to Blondie's third question. Also, one of the fetters is attachment to rituals. Could one claim to be so liberated and so present that Vinaya rules no longer apply? Well, I mean, Vinaya rules aren't necessarily rituals. That, I mean, there's always some sort of objective reason given for Vinaya rules. And, I mean, the actual ritual stuff, like formal acts of the Sangha, you know, there's it's always a clear-cut reason for why you're doing this. And, you know, there's no worshipy stuff going on, at least none of the required stuff in the text is like worshipy stuff. So, I mean, it's just the rules of conducting the Sangha. You know, rules of the Sangha. You join the Sangha, you know, you're required to follow such and such rules. And even if you become fully enlightened so that you can't really do anything bad anymore, you know, let's say an, an Arahant accidentally drinks alcohol. You know, it's like some fruit juice started to ferment in the hot weather. He drinks it. He drank alcohol, but really he hasn't gotten any demerit for that. Or let's say he's sleeping and while he's asleep, some woman comes into the building, sits down on a chair, you know, on the other side of the building, you know, for whatever reason, gets up and leaves. I mean, technically he's committed an offense for lying down under the same roof with a woman even though the woman wasn't necessarily lying down. I mean, they, you can't even sit down together under the same roof with the woman. Well, maybe if you're not in the same room, but certainly you're not supposed to be lying down under the same roof with a woman. Fully enlightened being can do that. There, There is at least one <coughs> case in Vinaya of, of an Arahant breaking a rule, and that was that he would go for alms round, I think it was only once or twice a week, and then he would just save his rice. He'd dry it out in the sun, and then he'd just get it wet like days later and just eat reconstituted rice. And so that's still against the rules, even though it was a fully enlightened being. I mean, he didn't get any demerit because of it, because he was fully enlightened. He wasn't making karma anymore. But still, it's like you belong to an organization that has certain rules. You're obligated to follow those rules. Nobody forced you 
to join the Sangha anyway. It's just kind of cheating. It's like if if you're enlightened and you play Monopoly, I mean, that doesn't mean that you can just cheat, especially if you're the banker. So, yeah, there it's, it's more than just attachment to rituals is attachment to morality and observances what you call what, what blondie is calling rituals we can call observances so sila is morality wata is observances so that's rules that really do not have any ethical quality to them it's just like etiquette or manners that kind of thing or just I mean, I mean, some serious rules. I was thinking about this the other day. It's like, like some of the really serious rules, like Sangha de Sesa rules. Like w one of them is if a monk wants to build a hut for himself, then he has to get approval of the site for the, the building site from the Sangha. They have to okay it first to make sure he's not going to be messing up any ant hills or, you know, destroying vegetation or anything. And then it, it's not allowed to be very big. It's, I mean, it'd be like 12 or 13 feet. No, maybe even less than that. Maybe like eight feet by five feet would be the maximum. So just big enough to lie down and sit down in it. And that if you break that rule, that's even a more serious rule than killing an animal or telling a lie. So, I mean, some of the rules is uh, the ecclesiastical severity of the transgression is out of proportion with ethics. But um, where was I? That was that was kind of a digression, wasn't it? Let's see. Could one claim to be so liberated and so present that Winnie rules no longer apply? Well, I mean. Some Zen masters also like Padma Sambhava, in, who was like considered to be a second Buddha in Tibet. I mean, they would break the rules. Padma Sambhava was, I think for a while he was living in a cemetery with a young woman and they were like, I, I can't remember if they were eating the flesh of corpses or not, but at the very least they were eating like funeral offerings to the, to the dead in a, in a cemetery together, living in a cave together, that kind of thing. So, and then you got like the Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra of the Mahayana Buddhists where you've got this very advanced bodhisattva, allegedly more advanced even than the Buddha's chief disciples, who's like going to taverns and brothels and so forth. But in Theravada Buddhism, you know, the Buddha himself would not break the rules. He made the rules. He wasn't going to break them. And so, I mean, if you're enlightened, but not ordained into the Sangha, then maybe you could get away with doing stuff that uh, a conscientious monk wouldn't do. But it's, it's not just a matter of, um, let's see, you get, once you get enlightened, you know, you don't need the, the raft anymore, you know, the raft for crossing the flood. But uh, still, you're still voluntarily a member of an organization that has these rules. You agreed to follow those rules when you joined and so just a matter of like honesty or integrity would keep even an enlightened being from breaking rules even if they were they were like dumb rules or maybe i should say like trivial rules so i don't really i'm i am myself mystified as to whether i actually answered that question but i'm going to move on to the next question because the next question is from maitreya buddha and maitreya buddha says have you considered attending a local Vipassana meditation retreat center? And I kind of consider it briefly when I first came to South Carolina, but um, I honestly do not recall ever having met a Buddhist. Well, maybe I have. Yeah, one person came to visit me and he was a Buddhist. He still is a Buddhist, I think. Um, in fact, he's the... Uh, the Buddhist, uh, I don't want to scroll up, but he was the per first person to ask a question this time. But locally, I don't know any Buddhists, and I'm unaware of the existence of any local Vipassana meditation retreat centers. I mean, we're in um, not a very big town in South Carolina, and it's in the Bible Belt, and it's probably most people who have any religious inclinations are Baptist Christians. So, and then most Vipassana meditation retreat centers, I mean, they're like pretty much 
like cultural Mar neo-Marxist indoctrination centers in addition to meditation halls recently, last several years anyhow. So, I don't know. I don't know if there's like a, I don't know where the, the nearest Goinka center would be. I mean, that wouldn't be too bad. But it's not really on my list of priorities. So, yeah, I'm, I'm probably not going to be attending any local Vipassana meditation retreat centers anytime in the near future, assuming that there even are any. I think there is a, a Sinhalese monastery somewhere in the neighborhood of Greenville, South Carolina. But whether they would have meditation retreats or not, and if they do have meditation retreats, whether they would be mindfulness of white privilege and inherent racism and that kind of silliness, I don't know. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Stellar Supreme, formerly known as Lieberlam. And Lieberlam says, do you believe in Sabanyuta Nyana, which is essentially omniscience? Although in brackets here, he's, he's got it defined as attainment of supreme enlightenment and the removal of all obscuration regarding the range of what may be known. It points to the Buddha's acquisition of omniscience. Yeah, so essentially, Sabanyuta Nyana is omniscience. And in Theravada Buddhism, it's not like in Jainism. In Jainism, a fully enlightened Jain, like a Tirthankara, like, like uh, Mahavira himself, he knows everything at all times. You know, whenever he, he sees anything, he, he like perceives it from all possible angles. You know, he sees all the conditions associated with this and it's, it re would require omniscience even to do that. Whereas in Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism anyhow, the Buddha can know whatever he wants to know. So he's not like completely omniscient at all times. It's just that if he wants to know the answer to something, he just kind of looks in that direction and he sees the answer. So Stellar Supreme, previously known as Lieberlam, asked me, do I believe in omniscience? And I do think there is a certain kind of omniscience. And I think that really advanced saints can really come up with, um, I don't know if they would be like perfect omniscience. I assume there would be certain things that they would not know. How many hairs are on the head of Joe Schmo, the refrigerator repairman living in Hoboken, New Jersey? I mean, whether they would know that, whether they would, like the Buddha would be able to speak fluent Swahili or not. I mean, I'm, I kind of, I'm rather doubtful of that, but there is a certain kind of omniscience that comes with enlightenment because you're no longer bound by the limitations of your own perceptions. You're, you have access to infinite consciousness. And that in itself is a more important kind of omniscience, just to be aware of the ultimate essence of everything than to know the details of this samsaric dream that is based on delusion that we are dreaming. So, I mean, to know ultimate reality is a kind of omniscience because that's the only reality there is and it's of one taste you know it's this it's not like variegated and then what we consider to be reality this empirical samsaric reality isn't reality at all it's, it's kind of a virtual reality conditional reality and so it's it's hard to say. I mean, there's like an infinite number of, of worlds with you know all kinds of you know, anything that's possible in an infinite universe is going to exist, at least in the samsaric conditional sense. So, yeah, I believe that there is a certain kind of omniscience that enlightened beings would have. And I think that very advanced sages can have a kind of... I mean, I don't, they can know things that other people don't know. You know, they can like know your past lives, even though you yourself don't know your past lives, that kind of a thing. But I am kind of skeptical as to whether the Buddha would know how many hairs are on somebody's head or would, if he would know how to speak fluent Swahili, that kind of thing. So I guess I answered that question. There's some, there's some tough questions this time. 
So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Skuladin or Skuladin. And he says, is there a legit strategy to fake it till you make it? And he's got this weird little commentary here saying, Andy Kaufman's whole life was fake it till you make it, which was ridiculously effective, even though he was drawing inspiration from Saturday morning cartoons, crummy alcoholic lounge singers, professional wrestling or Elvis. Normies generally write off Andy as either an idiot or mean-spirited buffoon, which I find to be a gross mischaracterization, mischaracterization, especially since he hit gold in multiple industries that have little to no overlap, like wrestling, Saturday Night Live, sitcoms, and stand-up. And his biography mentions he was practicing mindfulness and transcendental meditation. Well, from what I know about Andy Kaufman, he was very temperamental and hard to work with, hard to get along with. And with regard to his wrestling career, I do remember as a publicity stunt, he challenged the world's champion female wrestler to a match and beat her easily. So then he, he started getting arrogant and cocky. So he challenges the male world champion wrestler, you know, this big Hulk Hogan type. And the wrestling match lasted like 10 seconds. The, the big Hulk Hogan type just walks out, grabs Andy Kaufman, just flips him upside down and throws him down on his head. Andy Kaufman is just like unconscious, lying flat on the, on the canvas. And uh, yeah, he was wearing a neck brace for quite a while after that. And I remember he was on uh, the David Letterman show and he just started freaking out. He, he, he was on the show with Letterman and the wrestler that hospitalized him. And at one point, he, he made some kind of snotty remark to the wrestler who just, he's sitting there in this relaxed, you know, he's just kind of laid back like this. He just kind of reaches out and just slaps Andy Kaufman out of his chair because <laughs> he wasn't taking crap off of him. And Andy Kaufman, I mean, this might have been part of a publicity stunt, but it seemed for real. He just started screaming in hysteria, ran off the stage. He ran back on, grabbed the Letterman's coffee and threw it onto the wrestler and ran off the stage again. So whether Andy Kaufman was some sort of philosopher or not, I'm, I'm rather skeptical of that. But let's just get back up to Skeladin's question. Is there a legit strategy to fake it till you make it? Yeah, I think fake it till you make it does work to some degree. Although you shouldn't fake it to the extent that you're trying to pass yourself off as what you're faking. It's like a, like a sage does not start screaming in anger. So you have these urges to scream in anger. You just repress these urges, even though you're not the sage yet. Still, by imitating what you want to become, it helps you to become that. It's like they've done psychological studies where like if you sit in, a, in an alert posture, it helps you to be alert. You know, you, with the back straight. And that's one reason why when you're meditating, you should sit with your back straight and your, your head and you know, your spine all in a line as as much as possible because if you adopt an alert kind of posture it helps you to be alert or they also did psychological studies where they would have a man and a woman who are strangers you know they're probably college students they're doing the psychological study at a, at a university probably and if they had them sitting close to each other like really close like in each other's space they were more likely you know it's sort of the way lovers would sit you know like knee to knee talking to each other in soft tones, that it helped them, it caused them to have more, an increase of actual feelings of like attraction towards each other, that kind of thing. It's just by adopting the posture or adopting the outward form of something, it helps you to move in that direction because at least some of the obstacles are removed. So yeah, to that extent, that fake it till you make it, if you want to become an enlightened sage, then it helps you to behave as much as possible like an enlightened sage, even just superficially. But of course, you shouldn't try to pass yourself off as an enlightened sage. An enlightened sage would be humble, and so you should be humble too. That kind of thing. So I'm just going to move on to Skaladin's next question. Are there any principles or phenomenon? He says phenomenon. I'm, I'm a grammar Nazi to, to the extent that it, it does bug me when people use phenomenon as a plural. So, 
are there any principles or phenomena that I could explain to make karma more predictable or to secure certain outcomes? And then in his uh, little um, commentary, he says, like the differences between Schrodinger's cat and Pandora's box. And I don't really get the, uh, the analogy there. Um, Schrodinger's cat, I mean, it's, it's not very predictable. I mean, either the cat is dead or it's not, and you don't know which. Or maybe it's, it's like in this state of quantum nebulous uncertainty where it's alive and dead and both and neither and none of the above. <clears throat> um, but anyways, getting back to the question, his, his commentaries, his explanatory commentaries just kind of distract me and I lose the thread of the question. Not that I'm complaining. So, are there any principles or phenomena that I could exploit to make karma more predictable or to secure certain outcomes? Well, I mean, there's the obvious thing you do. I mean, if you want good outcomes, you should do good. I mean, you should, you should do meritorious kusala kama. You know, you should do what is good and right, and then what is good and right is more likely to happen back to you. And even... If you do good and right and something that isn't good and right comes back to you, in a way, it secretly is good and right because that's what you need to help you to learn how to deal with it or, or you know, whatever it is. Sometimes we need seemingly bad things to happen to us in order to knock us out of ruts or cause us to introspect or, or whatever it is. We just have to learn how to deal with it. It's sort of like Groundhog Day. You just keep having to face this thing over and over again until you get it right. So, yeah, I mean, that's like the obvious answer, it seems to me. I mean, you can't really just manipulate your karma to like create a, like a predetermined outcome or anything like that. Maybe some kind of really advanced sage or swami could do such a thing to some degree. But maybe I should move the microphone farther from my mouth after talking for an hour. <clears throat> huh. so yeah i mean if you do good good's more likely to happen back if you do bad bad is more likely to happen back if you do good you're more likely to have a certain degree of contentment and serenity if you do a lot of bad you're more likely to have a troubled mind more insecurity and and fear and worry that kind of thing so yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that would really be it. That's like the, op the obvious answer. If there's any more subtle kind of answer that I could give, I really don't know what it is. So I'm just going to move on to Skeladin's next question. And that is, is it possible that you could make a video with F. Gardner? And then his, uh, his commentary is, apparently he's Buddhist and has some far out ideas. His YouTube channel should show up if you search his name. Well, actually... F. Gardner has actually contacted me before, and he said that he he's watches my videos sometimes, and I inspired him to make one or two videos where he's just talking about something that he thought of as a result of, of, of watching one of my videos. But uh, I mean, if he wanted to do a video with me, I'm not exactly sure what we would talk about. I don't know him very well. I mean, I hardly know him at all. We never actually conversed. We've just sort of like typed to each other. But uh, I mean, if he wanted to do a video with me, I'd be game, especially if it was about something that I have something to say about. So yeah, F. Gardner has, uh, has already contacted me and um, yeah, I have, I've had some influence on him apparently because he watches my, my videos. So yeah, if F. Gardner, if you're out there, you want to do a video, I'm, I'm game. And I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Outer Haven. And this is uh, a response to something I said on the previous q and I'm pretty sure. That is, how would the order know if one is even transgender or not? Are the monks or bhikkhunis required to lift their robes to make sure? How do we know that Panyobasa himself is not in fact the first transgender Buddhist monk? Well, I mean, usually transgender people, it's pretty obvious that they're transgender. There are a few 
transgender people who have transitioned, especially from male to female, that they can pass themselves off as real females or biological females, I should say. Um, I've never seen a transgender man, like a woman, a biological woman who transitioned to, to male that was really, pers really con like obviously a guy. It was like, you know, you just can tell that they were biological women that transitioned. But um, it doesn't, I mean, whether the order knows or not, I mean, this is, this is in response to uh, an answer I gave to a question about transgender monks. And you just cannot have a transgender monk. It's just built right into the rules that even if you ordained a transgender person as a monk or a nun, the ordination would be invalid. They still wouldn't be a monk or a nun, no matter how hard they tried. Because it just, it's just forbidden. The Buddha himself apparently forbade it from happening. And you can, you can just get ordained every day for the rest of your life. And if you're transgender, it's not going to stick. It's never going to be a valid ordination because it's just built into the system that in order to be a monk, you have to be a biological intact male. And in order to be a nun, you have to be not only a biological female, but you can't even be like really butch. I mean, you can't even have a lot of masculine qualities or you're not supposed to be ordained. Um, some cases might be like borderline cases where, you know, they would allow the ordination. But someone who was born biologically male and then transitioned to female would qualify as a eunuch, technically going with <clears throat> like uh, ancient Indian monastic discipline. And... Yeah, I, like a, a woman, a biological woman who are, transitions to a male would not have, would not be literally intact. I mean, she would not have the family jewels. You might have fake plastic ones or something. That's not good enough. So whether or not, even if one of them kind of sneaks in, you know, they, they pass themselves off as being born of that gender, Still, even if the, the Sangha doesn't know, all they're doing is just kind of poisoning the well of the Sangha by having a fake monk or a fake nun in the Sangha, which might cause trouble. I mean, it might just derail the Sangha. If enough of, enough of this happened, you might have then, like I was mentioning before, you have to have at least five monks to ordain a new monk. And if you've got five monks and one of them is fake, he's not really a monk, then the ordination does is again, it's invalid. And then this person thinks he's a monk and it just like perpetuates this problem of, of fake monks or fake nuns or just people that think that they're monks or nuns who aren't. And there has been a lot of that happening. In fact, in Thailand, the Dhammayut sect just considers the Mahanikaya sect of Theravada Buddhism to be fake, that they're not they're not real just because the, the ordination lineage got so corrupted by people who were like Parajika. They had gotten, they'd, they had done something bad enough to be excommunicated. And then they just stayed in robes and still participated in ordination ceremonies and so forth. And it just poisoned the whole well in a manner of speaking. So let's see, how would the order know if one is even transgender or not? Well, I mean, you could also have just a wise monk or a, a wats, any kind of sage in the Sangha, male or female, who would probably pick up on the fact that this person is not 100% male or 100% female. But as a general rule, it's, it's pretty obvious. So how do we know that Ponyabasa himself is not, in fact, the first transgender Buddhist monk? Well, I mean, there would be no first transgender Buddhist monk. I mean, like I, like I keep saying, if you are transgender, in, even if you go through the ordination ceremony, it's just not real. Even if nobody knows, you know, even if all the monks participating in the ceremony think that you're a legit, like biological intact male, still the ordination is invalid. It's not a real ordination. <clears throat> so there, nobody could ever be the first transgender Theravadan bhikkhu anyway. 
But I mean, if you think that I'm really a girl or something, not a very attractive one. And I don't know where I'd find <clears throat> like spike heeled pumps that would fit me. I wear like a, a 15 in men's. Got big hands too. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of a, just sort of a follow up to a, question I answered before and it's, it just dawned on me that somebody I think it might be the proto pseudo monk asked a question recently to a, a Q&A that was like Q&A number 23 or something it was he's he's like going back and re watching the old Q&As where uh which is not a bad idea if you, if I mean, some questions I, I answer over and over again because people don't take the trouble to watch all 102 previous Q&As before they, they ask me a question. So I do apologize. I think he's already asked three questions on this list anyway. So, I mean, <clears throat> maybe I can uh, go through my, my feed or my comments and uh, that can be the first question on, on the next Q&A. I mean, sometimes this does happen. People will ask me questions in like an unusual place. And usually when I do my, like compile the questions, I'll look at the most recent Q and A, you know, on, on uh, YouTube, BitChute and Rumble. And then I'll go to the, the, uh, the discord server where there's the Q and A room where people ask questions there. And, uh, if, if somebody asks a question that isn't in one of those places, there's a good chance that I'm just not going to think to to compile it. I won't I won't see it and it won't be on the list. So I'm just I'm just saying that sometimes people do ask questions and then it just the question falls through the cracks. Sometimes it just gets disappeared by YouTube's algorithm for whatever reasons. Other times it's just in this obscure place and I, I don't think to look there or or whatever and then I don't answer the question. So I do apologize to those of you who have asked me questions and I just haven't gotten to the question because it just didn't wind up on my, on my list for whatever reason. Do not, do not fear and do not despair that uh, it's not because I disapproved of the question or any such thing. It's very few questions that I won't answer that are asked of me, like questions that are obviously rhetorical or in bad faith you know, just sort of kind of sneering kind of questions, something like that I might not answer. But then again, I still might just, just for the fun of it. So anyways, the next question is from Cactus Ray. And Cactus Ray says, I'm curious to know if you have ever met anyone that you believe was a fully enlightened Arahant. If so, how would you describe that person? If not, have you ever met someone that you don't believe was fully enlightened, but would describe as having special spiritual attainment. And again, um, I'm kind of a heretic to the extent that I'm uncertain if an Arahant can even exist within a, a Samsaric context. That an unenlightened person who looks at an enlightened being isn't going to see an enlightened being necessarily. They're going to, I mean, you're going to be looking at that person through unenlightened colored glasses. And an enlightened being might still appear to have certain personality traits that would be incompatible with the extremely high standards of a Theravadan Arahant. So <clears throat> with that as a kind of intro to my position, that really, I mean, the existence of an Arahant might be just a kind of a weird paradox or, you know, something that is just indeterminate. So, have I ever met anyone that I believe was a fully enlightened Arahant? Um, a few Q&As ago, I answered essentially the same question. And the only person I could really think of that might qualify would be Shui Umin Seattle, who was the founder of Shui Umin Yekta. He was originally a disciple of Mahasi Seattle. Mahasi Seattle chose him to be his successor in the Mahasi tradition. Shui Umin Seattle turned down the offer and just went his own way. Um... And I did meet him once and I didn't meet him long enough to really see what kind of a person he was. He was just about 90 years old at the time and just very alert, sitting just straight up and down, just with like this penetrating gaze, you know, it's like he was looking right through you. 
And even if he wasn't a fully enlightened Arahant, <clears throat> um, he did have some kind of spiritual attainment. But with regard to other monks, I mean, I met a monk, I've met quite a few monks that had a reputation for being Arahants. In fact, in certain parts of Northwestern Burma, even I had a reputation for being an Arahant. Like, for example, I met Iwamun Seattle, who had a reputation for being an Arahant. And I went to see him, and he was soft-spoken, friendly, nice monk. But, I mean, you can't really tell. I mean, it's, it's not like there's going to be, like, angels blowing trumpets up above his head, you know? He doesn't have this, like, a, he doesn't have, like, a certificate on the wall that he attained Arahantship, anything like that. And, uh... That it reminds me of a saying by Ram Das: when a pickpocket meets a saint, all he notices are his pockets. On another thing that Ram Das said that, that uh, is applicable here is, let's say somebody is self-conscious because they have a big nose. They walk down the street, all they're noticing is how big other people's noses are. And so we have that same kind of unenlightened approach to things, so that even if we're presented with an enlightened being, I mean, we're, we're seeing them through an unenlightenment filter. And so it's, it's very difficult to say, I mean, only an Arahant can really know if another person is an Arahant or not. And even then, maybe not. So, yeah, I did, I have met a few old monks that, I mean, they could have been just highly advanced sages, but you can't really tell because they're just a soft-spoken, polite, you know, alert, serene kind of a person that, I mean, how are you going to know? But of, of the ones that I have met in person, the one I would say is maybe has the best chance of being an Arhat would be Shui Um in Seattle. And he has now passed away. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Fred. And Fred says, I don't think Nibbana is separate from the all. It should be all in the block of marble, in my opinion, question mark. And yeah, I mean, going with the, the, the simile of the block of marble, Nibbana is the block of marble. It is the uncarved block that has all the statues inside it. So Nibbana would be essence and uh, the samsaric forms would be form. So yeah, Nibbana is the block. It's not contained in the block. It's just the block. So I'm just going to move on to Fred's next question. Can one really master the monkey mind? And it was like I was saying uh, earlier on in this Q&A, like with regard to the Anatta Lakana Sutta, you cannot say with regard to any of the five khandas, let it be this way, let it not be that way, and have it reliably happen. That's one of the arguments against there being any kind of ultimately real self. And even a fully enlightened being does not have complete control over his own body or over his own mental processes. So you can kind of master it, but you don't have complete control over it because there is no you anyway. It's just nature taking its course. So it depends on what you mean by master. If you mean to completely control something, to have something completely under your control, then no, even a fully enlightened being does not have complete control over his own mind but by master something means <clears throat> do you have as much control as it is possible to have or that you've just eradicated defilements and so forth then yeah um, assuming that within the context of samsara a fully enlightened being can even exist so i'm just going to move on to the next question this is from game fap and GameFap says, if you had to renounce Buddhism and pick another religion to join, which would it be and why? Well, if for whatever reason I had to stop being a Buddhist, then Vedanta, like Advaita Vedanta, you know, which is a relatively advanced philosophical school of Hinduism, comes pretty close to Buddhism. And it's just a few sort of subtle redefinitions of terms and so forth, a little bit different jargon. Um, but yeah, that, that comes closest to Buddhism, I think, would be <clears throat> uh, Advaita Vedanta. At least it comes close to like something like Majamaka, Mahayana Buddhism, because, I mean, they're very close to each other. 
This is the main difference is Vedanta kind of reifies the absolute and Majamaka does not. Or at least it tries its best to avoid reifying the absolute. So there is that. I mean, I have considered other religions. In fact, uh, just yesterday I was considering that, uh, I mean, sometimes it might be to my advantage to be a Christian scientist where they, uh, you know, they, they do not allow the seeing of doctors and taking of medicines and so forth. So there's that. But yeah, I think Advaita Vedanta would be the, would be the one I would have to pick. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Wayne. And Wayne says, Is the Christian born-again experience equivalent to the Buddhist Sotapanna, where one has an awakening faith or mindset, and whom has been forever transformed with no turning back until realization is met? Um, first of all, not being a Christian and never having been a born-again Christian in this lifetime, I can't really say with authority what exactly constitutes a born-again Christian. But I do think that a lot of people who consider themselves to be born again um, become unborn again and just, you know, they just go back to being a heathen or whatever. I mean, that happens a lot, especially with like high-profile celebrity kind of born-again Christians who uh, just kind of, I don't know, they lose momentum in their born again and uh, just kind of go back to the way they were before. They backslide, if you will. But I do think that a born-again Christian, and I've actually made this comparison, um, is roughly equivalent to the original meaning of Sotapanna in Buddhism, which is just somebody who has embarked upon a genuine spiritual path for the first time, and they're very like inspired and motivated. You know, they've got beginner's mind. I do think that was probably the original meaning of a Sotapanna, and then it got turned into a superhuman state. And I don't think a born-again Christian is, has attained a superhuman state necessarily. And the original Sotapannas, I think, probably had not attained a superhuman mental state. Although nowadays, you're an Arya, you know, you, there's certain qualifications, you're guaranteed of becoming enlightened within X number of lives and all that, that... Um, yeah, I think that that is a later development, and I do think do not think that that is original. So part of the the ambiguity or complex complexness of this question is, you know, what exactly? Not only what is a born again Christian, but what exactly is a Buddhist Sotapanna? Because I'm a, somewhat of a heretic in in my interpretation of the uh, the four stages of Aryahood. So. I mean, I have met a lot of people who consider themselves to be soda upon us. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they can backslide too. So, yeah, I do think, though, in sort of trying to get to Wayne's question and adhering to Wayne's question until it is answered, yeah, I would say that a born-again Christian, you know, like a sincere, authentic born-again Christian would be... Mm, like a, a Christian equivalent to the original meaning of a Sotapanna or stream enterer in Buddhism, who again was like sincerely inspired and it was a life changing experience. And you know, they finally like um, awakened to like the importance of a spiritual life. They've started to see the samsara or the world or their life in spiritual terms and start having spiritual priorities instead of just worldly priorities. That to the extent that a born again Christian and a, you know, a Buddhist is, I mean, to the extent that they're both like this, I would say that it's pretty much of an, an equivalence, even though they're in different religions using different, jargon and having certain different like starting principles and so forth. So I'm just going to move on to the next question, which is from Pyramid. And Pyramid says, what is your experience with Islam when living in Burma? I hear a lot of the Buddhist monks there have an intense dislike of Islam due to the problems its followers have created. So yeah, I've met a few Muslims in Burma. Not very many, though, because I was mainly in just the heartland of Buddhist Burma. Although, 
a lot of villages would have a few Muslims. And uh, I have mentioned, I think it was in a relatively recent video that uh, a lot of the time uh, the village butcher will be a Muslim because it's not considered to be immoral for a Muslim to kill animals. Whereas for a Buddhist, it's not only immoral, but it's also very low status. The, the village butcher is going to be, you know, he's going to be at the bottom of the social totem pole, so to speak. So, um, the Muslims I did meet, just like out in the villages, I mean, they hadn't reached the critical mass where they start getting aggressive and intolerant. You know, it's, it's kind of well known in Burma, I guess, that like a few Muslims can be good neighbors, they're good people, but once you get to a certain critical mass of them, they start getting intolerant and aggressive. And it's a stereotype, I guess, but the Burmese believe in this stereotype. And aside from, you know, this, the friendly, I mean, I had a few Muslims put food into my bowl. You know, there's some of them, you know, especially if they're living in a Buddhist country, they would just consider the Buddha to be one of the prophets. You know, Islam doesn't insist that Muhammad was the only prophet. You know, Moses was a prophet. Jesus was a prophet. And so some of them will kind of, stretch that a bit and say that Buddha was a prophet too, like a genuine prophet of God, even though the Buddha really didn't teach the existence of God. So, I mean, aside from the few friendly or sort of invisible Muslims in the villages that, uh, um, you know, I met a, a few in Rangoon, like, like the people that sell eyeglasses tend to be Muslims. In Rangoon for some reason I don't know why that is it's just like the tradition that certain trades in in the big cities will sort of um, be dominated by Muslims also I, I will say it just just remember that um, there was a big riot in uh, the city of Maitila when I was living maybe 13 miles from there and <sighs> let's see I just heard about it. It's, you know, days afterwards, I heard what happened where some woman went to, uh, it was like a, I don't know, he, he was like a pawnbroker or something, and he was a Muslim. So this Burmese Buddhist woman has this hair comb she wants to sell to this guy. And when he's testing it to see how good it is, he accidentally breaks it. And then he refuses to buy it and won't pay for, you know, won't pay for it. He just gives her the broken comb back. And so she's complaining about this. He just tells her to get lost. So she goes back to her, her village or her neighborhood, gets, gets some guys. And I think there was a, a Buddhist monk came with her and they go back and they're demanding that he either, you know, he compensated her for breaking the comb that he refuses to buy. And then it turned into like a shoving match and somebody got pushed down and it started getting ugly so that the monk who's trying to be like a peacemaker, he says, let's try to discuss this. And so some, some Muslim men agree, they, they go off somewhere. And the story I heard, I don't know exactly what this entails, but he said they cut his neck and he died. So whether they you know, cut his throat or whatever, but he, we had a dead monk at the hands of some Muslims, which caused the entire Muslim district. I mean, it was just, a lot of it just got burned to the ground. And a lot of the time, you know, there's all these stories about some, some Buddhist girl getting raped by Muslims. You know, that's, that's pretty common that you hear rumors of such things, whether it's actually common for it to really happen or not. I don't know for sure, but there is that. And I will say that, uh, also, I lived in the, the city of, or on a, in the village, Ye Chan O village, cold water pot village that was at the northern end of the, the, the city of Mei Myo, which is now called Pien Uluen. And there were a lot of Muslims there too, in, in the area of Pien Uluen or Mei Myo. And there was actually a, a, like a, a Muslim school that I walked past every morning when I went for alms. There was this Muslim school there down by the side of the road and the abbot of the monastery, um, you know, he knew enough about the, the gossip and everything that, that this, these people, these Muslims did not have a permit 
for starting a school there. So he had him, he, he essentially turned him in and the school got shut down because he didn't want Muslim schools, especially <clears throat> illegal Muslim schools, like half a block away from the monastery. But I mean, that's, that's my experience with, with Islam. I mean, I've never had any bad, any kind of bad interactions with Muslims, mainly because it was an overwhelmingly Buddhist culture that I was in. And there would be a few Muslims there who, you know, sort of like black people in the 1950s, where you just get along with, with everybody else by being very friendly and very nice. And there's no problem, or at least it reduces the prejudice against them. But there are quite a few Muslims. I think Islam would be the second most populous religion in Burma. Or Christian, maybe in, in the, like the, the ethnic groups on the outskirts of the country. But like in the heartland of, of Burma, I think Islam would be the second most populous religion. And uh, of course, you know, you got the 969 movement and Ashin Wirathu and all that who want the Muslims to just get out of Burma mainly because they don't want that critical mass to be reached. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Joe Doe. And Joe Doe says, Is there any, or has there been any war worth the bad karma of participating? And that's a value judgment. And each person has to decide for him or herself. And no doubt that uh, just about any war has <clears throat> some people... Um, thinking, well, the bad karma is, is worth us, you know, not losing this war, especially if it's a war of self-defense. You know, you've got some horde of barbarians invading your country and you're fighting so that, you know, your, your wife and your daughters don't get raped and enslaved and so forth. Then, I mean, there's still going to be bad karma involved, but I mean, it's a lot of people just think it's, it's their duty. I mean, if you're a, a husband and a father, and just a, a, a property owner, then it might be worth the, uh, the effort to fight against the invader rather than just have your property and your wife and your daughter taken away, plus maybe getting your stabbed or your head cut off besides. So it's just a value judgment in that case, whether a person is, I mean, if they're just an uncompromising pacifist or whether they think that really... Like my father fought in World War II and uh, he really felt that, you know, it was just the thing you had to do. It was just like your duty. It was just your ethical duty to prevent the Nazis from, from conquering the Western Hemisphere. So he was a Buddhist. But then again, it's like, I mean, from the Orthodox Buddhist point of view, then no, I mean, you're better off just getting killed. It's, it's just uncompromising pacifism that you're better off dying than like stomping on an ant because dying is, has, is ethically neutral. Whereas stomping on an ant, if you do it on purpose, that's bad karma. So yeah, this is, it's just kind of value judgment kind of question. I don't think it really has an objective answer unless the answer is just based on orthodox Theravada Buddhism, in which case the, the answer would be no, there never has been any war worth the bad karma of participating in it, at least with regard to the killing part. I mean, Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi Mohandas K. Gandhi, I mean, he joined the, the military in, in World War I, but he was an unarmed stretcher bearer. He and his followers joined uh, the, the war effort in World War I as unarmed stretcher bearers. So he was participating in a war, although he was not contributing to the bloodshed. You know, he was just trying to, to help the injured soldiers. And some of the Indians were criticizing him outspokenly because he shouldn't even be, you know, he, first of all, he shouldn't be helping the, the British colonists, the colonialists. And also, you know, he shouldn't be like helping soldiers that have been killing other soldiers. But... I mean, something like that, I think, uh, I mean, that could be ethically positive. That could be kusala, meritorious. But uh, the actual killing part, Orthodox Theravada would say there's no circumstance where 
um, being a soldier shooting others, other people would be worth it. That you're better off just getting executed for refusing to fight. So I'll just move on to Jodo's next question, which is what was the Buddha's answer to the question of God and creation? And I mean, he gave a few answers that you can find in the suttas. And also to some degree, he just refused to answer like with regard to the creation of the world. That was one of the questions that the Buddha just refused to answer. Like is the world, um, is it infinite? I mean, is it eternal or did it have a beginning? How did the world begin? He doesn't talk about that. And then, I mean, in other suttas, he does. Like there's this long, strange sutta in the Digha Nikaya where he's talking about how, how this universe, how this cosmos kind of generates due to the power of karma and so forth. It's, it's, it's not God that creates samsara. It's just that like the first thing that appears, like the universe is destroyed usually by fire, just the, like the astronomical universe. And then... Um, just the power of karma of all these beings that have to be reborn, it generates a new cosmos. And the first thing that appears is the throne of Brahma. And then Brahma appears, Maha Brahma. And he's sitting on his throne and looking around and he's pretty, pretty empty and barren. And he starts getting lonely. And right around the time he starts getting lonely and wishing that he had some companions through the power of their own karma, not because of his wishes, but through the power of their own karma, more beings start appearing in this Brahma realm. And then this Maha Brahma sitting on the throne thinks that because he wished them to exist, that they exist because of that. And so he starts considering himself to be a creator God. That's actually an explanation found in the texts. But in other cases, the Buddha kind of makes fun of, of the whole idea of God. You know, like someone who believes in God, it's like a man who is in love with the most beautiful woman in the world. And you, you talk to this man, it's like, well, it's this beautiful woman in the world, this most beautiful woman that you're in love with. I mean, is she tall or is she short? And he says, well, I don't know. It's like, well, I mean, does she have like a, a lighter complexion or a golden complexion or like a more brownish complexion? No, I, I don't know that either. And. And finally, after asking these questions, then you ask, well, I mean, have you ever seen this most beautiful woman in the world that you're so in love with? And he said, no, I've never met her before. So it's, it's just, he's just kind of making fun of people who believe in a God that they really have never experienced or never seen, or, you know, they have no real proof of, of this God's existence. So what was the Buddha's answer to the question of God and creation? Um, yeah, there would be two entirely different things except for the sort of the deluded Brahma who thinks that he created the universe when he really didn't. But the cosmos, you know, the, the empirical universe, um, it was not created by a God. It's just generated through ignorance and delusion and karma. It's just sort of materializes through the power of karma of, of infinite beings that need some place to, to live their deluded virtual lives. And uh, gods, like they're they're all small g gods, and uh, they I mean they live longer than we do, but they are still mortal. They might live a zillion gajillion years, but still they're going to die and then get reborn somewhere else. So, I mean, like in in Hinduism, they can turn they can sort of personify the absolute as Brahma, but um, in Buddhism. Nirvana or the, the absolute just does not get personified as any kind of capital G God. So I kind of answered that. Answered it enough, I guess, because I'm moving on to the next question. And this question is from L. Reeve. And L. Reeve says, Are you the same person as Otomo, also known as Zen Bits? And that's kind of a strange question because I don't look anything like him. I do know him. I mean, we, we have, we've never met in person, but uh, we were involved in a sort of a, a short-lived spiritual right movement thing that, uh, I mean, there's, there's still some videos up on the internet or on, on YouTube with regard to that. So we have been seen on a split screen, both of us at the same time. 
And yeah, he does not look like me. Um, <clears throat> we haven't communicated in over a year. He kind of dropped out of, out of the YouTube video biz for a long time. I think he just recently came back and he's more into Zen Buddhism. I'm more into Theravada. And uh, actually when I became a monk or when I stopped being a monk, when I just first came to South Carolina, he actually like sent me a hundred bucks, something like that. I was very generous of him, very thoughtful. But um, yeah, we're, we're not really communicating lately, but we are not the same person. And if you doubt that, you can go back and look at some of the videos where both of us appear on a split screen and we don't look anything like each other. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Mary J. And Mary J says, why people being reborn in hell don't just commit S? And the S here clearly stands for auto-termination. So I'll just start over again. I'll, I'll, I'll just replace the S so that it'll be a more smoother, smoother delivery. Why people being reborn in hell don't just commit auto-termination to be reborn maybe not there. They may try this many times and maybe some next time would be reborn as humans and practice Dhamma and attain Nibbana. I would certainly try this. Nothing to lose, right? I mean, nobody has only bad karma, so it should work. Well, I, I'm doubtful that it's possible to commit suicide when you're in hell. That, you know, it's like you are prevented. Like, you can have demons that are like cutting the flesh off your body, cutting the flesh off your skeleton with, with like axes, but you don't die from that. You just get better. And then they do it again. And then you get better again. And then they keep, they just keep doing that. So, I mean, you could just be reduced to nothing but bones and scattered bits of meat, and you're still not going to die. So I don't know how you could possibly commit suicide um, if you're in hell. That uh, It's like the system is, is designed naturally so that you can't just take the easy out that way. Otherwise, probably a lot of people would be doing it. Or a lot of hell denizens would be doing it anyway. So, yeah... Yeah, plus it may be that you're just making more bad karma by trying to kill yourself. So there's that too. Yeah, I think that would be the main reason. I, I do think that just going with like traditional Orthodox Theravada Buddhism, that trying to kill yourself, trying to auto-terminate would be impossible in hell. Because as I say, I mean, you can you can just be like run through a blender and then you'll just like, coalesce and get better again so i'll just uh, move on to mary j's next question which is of a completely different nature this is like a politics question he says why montana has only three electors and i assume <clears throat> montana has only three electors because it is a sparsely populated state it's up north it's, it's kind of straddles the rocky mountains and uh it's just not a very populous state. So the way it works, according to the U.S. Constitution, is that each state gets two senators, whether it's a big state or a little state, whether it's California or Rhode Island, each state gets two senators, which is partly as a way of having equality among the states. But then also in the House of Representatives, the number of representatives is based on the population. So that even though California and Rhode Island each have only two senators, California has lots more representatives than Rhode Island does. And so I assume that electors work the same way as representatives and not senators. So a state with a large population would have more electors and a state with a small population would have few electors. Pretty sure that's how it works. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Sam. And Sam says, you mentioned a while ago that karma comes from your intentions rather than the outcome of your actions. So if I give you a meal and it has a nut you're allergic to, I would get the good karma for wanting to feed you, but not the bad karma for giving you stomach cramps, assuming I was ignorant of your nut allergy. But how would 
negligence come into this? Shouldn't I get some negative karma for not bothering to ask my guests if they have allergies before I cook them a meal? Well, yeah, that's that's something that has occurred to me lots of times with regard to merit and demerit, good karma and bad karma, because anything that you do, so long as you're not enlightened yet, virtually, practically, anything that you do is going to have some bad karma involved in it because you are delusional that moha or delusion is going to be one of your motivating factors for doing whatever it is. And so, I mean, just to believe that I am doing this, you know, if I do something and I believe I'm doing this, I mean, that's delusion. And so I'm going to get a certain amount of bad karma for, for doing that, no matter what it is. I could be like offering food to a monk or something. I'll still get some bad karma because there's still a sense of self. There's still some delusion or whatever involved. So, yeah, I mean, if you're a drunk driver and you accidentally hit somebody and kill them, then, yeah, that's that's major negligence. That'd be a more obvious example of this where, I mean, you didn't do it on purpose. So, I mean, you're not deliberately murdering somebody. You don't make the same karma as if you run over somebody on purpose. But still, there's all this delusion involved, especially if you're, you're stinking drunk, that is going to cause bad karma anyway. So I assume that if you give somebody some food <clears throat> that they're allergic to, you don't know they're allergic to it, then they have the allergic reaction that, um, I mean, you, you didn't do it on purpose. So you're not going to get as bad of karma, but there is going to be a certain amount of, I mean, not really negligence so much as just sort of semi-conscious stupidity involved because you're not fully enlightened yet. See, there was something else I was going to say, I think. But now I can't think of it. See. Yeah, I mean, negligence in the sense of you could have somehow made more precautions or something. That you're getting into more of a Western utilitarian kind of ethic that is alien to Buddhism. But still, to the extent that you're you're laboring under semi-conscious stupidity because you're not fully enlightened yet, then anything you do practically is going to create a certain amount of bad karma. You just try to do as much good as you can. And don't have remorse if you, if you accidentally do something, you know, because that just makes more bad karma. Remorse and regret are always bad karma and just make things worse. So I think I answered that one. So I'm just going to move on to Sam's next question, which is Sri Dharma, Sri Dharma Pavartika Acharya, the guy who says Hinduism is more properly called Sanatana Dharma, says that practicing meditation without a proper teacher is like performing surgery on yourself. Would you agree or disagree and why? Well, yeah, I, I do watch, I mean, I, I I wouldn't be able to say his name without reading it. And even when I'm reading it, I'm not doing a very good job of it. Sri Dharma Pravartika Acharya. Yeah, I, I have watched some of his videos. My sweetie and I watch his videos sometimes. Um, he is rather dogmatic. He, he sometimes, I mean, he's he seems like a wise and good person. But nevertheless, I mean, he does adhere to dogma a lot of the time. And... I think in Hinduism, there's much more emphasis on having a guru or a teacher. And also in Hinduism, they have different kinds of meditation than they have in Theravada Buddhism. Like Theravada Buddhism, there is, there's really nothing really dangerous if you're doing fairly correctly. I mean, you can learn how to do proper meditation in accordance with Theravada Dhamma by reading certain suttas, like the Mahasaripatana Sutta or the Anapana Sutta, for example. And Anapana meditation, I mean, there's very little danger involved in it. I mean, if you're, if you're not doing it right, you just won't get very far with it, but you're not really not going to like harm yourself by doing Anapana incorrectly, unless you're doing it just wildly incorrectly. You know, like holding your breath as long as you can until you're, you know, you start to black out or something. So there's there's no kundalini kind of meditations in Theravada that can be dangerous. Like 
you know, it's, it's relatively well known that you should not try to do Kundalini meditation without a guide guiding you, an experienced, qualified guide. Because if you do it wrong, you can mess yourself up. The Kundalini will like miss the spine channel and start going up the wrong way or something and just really mess up your body. And I mean, there are relatively dangerous like pranayama, like breath control stuff that uh, if, if you abuse it or you get into like the wrong territory or something, some, I mean, there's all kinds of Hindu meditations, some of which can be sketchy or dangerous if you're doing them wrong. But in Theravada Buddhism, it's pretty straightforward and simple. You know, you're not going for anything really esoteric when you're meditating other than just getting deeper and deeper and deeper, in which case you're also getting wiser and wiser and more capable of, of handling the situation. So, yeah, I think that uh, to the extent that he's referring to like Hindu meditations where you can really do it wrong and harm yourself, then yeah, I would agree with him. Although I don't think that would apply even to just simple basic meditation like mindfulness of breathing. So long as you have a fairly good idea of what you're doing and you know, you've know you read it in the text, how to do it, how to do it properly, you go ahead and do it by yourself without some human guru, then you're still doing okay. It's better to have a human teacher though because a human teacher can tell you what you're doing wrong. You know, they can you can go through interviews and they can say, well, do this differently. And, and it's better, you'll, you'll make better progress probably if you do have a human teacher but it's not exactly as bad like doing breathing meditation by yourself in your room is not nearly as bad as performing surgery on yourself but don't do like kundalini meditation or certain other esoteric hindu kinds of meditation um without it without some sort of qualified instructor so I'm just going to move on to the next question, which is also from Sam. Would deliberately inspiring somebody into a negative mental state with your words or actions incur bad karma? Or is that all on them? Well, their negative mental state is all on them, but your deliberately inspiring that in somebody is on you. So it's your intentions. It's, it's your volition, your will. If you are willfully trying to make somebody unhappy, then you're making bad karma. But when they really do become unhappy, that's on them. Because there's always a choice and they're just making the wrong choice through force of habit and ignorance and whatever. Even so, like you punch somebody in the nose, then that's on you. But for them to get upset about it is actually on them. Going with Buddhist ethics 101. So, I mean, you're just better off not deliberately making people unhappy, but you're, you're much better off not deliberately hurting people or even insulting somebody or just putting someone in their place. I mean, it's easy to do that, especially on the internet. You're like in the Breitbart's comment sections. I mean, it's, it's sometimes it's difficult to resist just sort of pointing out how stupid somebody is. But, I mean, it's, it's more for the sake of others who read it rather than trying to persuade somebody that he himself is stupid. So, yeah, I mean, just getting back to the question here. I mean, I've, I've just digressed all over the place. If I just answered the questions, these videos would probably be less than an hour. So, would deliberately inspiring someone into a negative mental state with your words or actions incur bad karma? Or is that all on them? Well, yeah. I mean, you are making bad karma, even though they're making their own bad karma. You're making bad karma, too. Just like if you punch somebody in the nose, I mean, the punch is on you. You are, I mean, you're getting the karma for that. And then if they get upset, their being upset is on them. But even so, you've made the bad karma regardless. Even if you just punched uh, an enlightened sage in the nose, he doesn't get upset at all. You know, he forgives you. He just beams love at you. Even so, your desire to mess him up and, and you're punching him in the nose is still making bad karma on you, even though he, he paid off a little past you know, fruition of karma, but he didn't make any new bad karma because he responded in a wise and benevolent way. And it's the same way with words, words or actions. 
So I'm going to move on to the next question here. This is from Twin Wasabi. And Twin Wasabi says, Do you have any opinions on hot coldman? He seems like your kind of guy. Well, I had never heard of hot coldman. But my lovely woman actually did a little research and informed me that he appears to be, she's not entirely certain either, but Hot Coldman appears to be a character in a video game. And I've never played that video game. I know nothing about Hot Coldman other than what I have just told you. So, yeah, I don't really have any opinions on Hot Coldman because I just have never come across Mr. Coldman in my life. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This one is uh, kind of a similarly straightforward one. This is from Nomi, although really it's Tig. And he says, how was your birthday cake? And as it turns out, I got two birthday cakes. Because at work, <clears throat> I just happened to mention that it's a tradition in my, it was a tradition in my family back when I had this, the aforementioned family, the said family, that my birthday cake every year was a rhubarb upside down cake. And so the wife of one of my colleagues at work very nicely got up at four in the morning to make me a rhubarb upside down cake. They had to search the grocery stores to find rhubarb because, of course, rhubarb really isn't that popular of a, of a food substance, especially in South Carolina, apparently. So I got a rhubarb upside down cake at work, which was excellent. I must say it was really good. The, the sweetness of the cake and the tartness of the rhubarb formed uh, a complex and striking flavor profile. Then when I got home, my lovely woman provided me with a different birthday cake, which was like a, a cheesecake and double Dutch chocolate layer thing, which was excellent. Although she left it on the counter and we have this dog, this whippet, which, uh, is not present at, at present, who actually climbed up onto the counter and ate some of it before I got any. It was still good, though. I mean, she doesn't have any major diseases that I'm aware of. So, yeah. So I got two cakes, and they were both really good. So one of them was slightly dog-eaten. And so I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from Siovac and Sipad Zidana. And Siovac and Sipat Zidana says, eating only once a day makes my head hurt. How do you overcome this? Well, I ate once a day for 30 years with very few exceptions. And I never, never got headaches. So, I mean, I can't really speak from experience on how not to get a headache from eating one meal a day. Although there were some people in the Discord server who were suggesting that the, the headaches from eating one meal a day may be caused by dehydration. In which case, you should you should drink more, especially in the afternoon. Don't drink right before going to bed, though, because then you have to get up and go potty. Although I did learn as a monk that if you don't want to indulge in excess of sleep, you can use the silent alarm clock, which is drinking a certain amount of liquid, generally water, right before you go to bed, so that within you know four to six hours you you, you can like calibrate this over time to get it just right that you're just going to have to get up and, and take a pee. It's the silent alarm clock method. But getting back to Siovac and Sipad Zidana, um, you can eat once a day. I mean, that's I did it for a long time, and uh, you're still allowed to have beverages in the afternoon. Beverages. Man cannot live by bread alone. There must also be a beverage. And so, I mean, you could still take in some fluid nutrition in the afternoon, also, I mean, if you wanted to follow monastic discipline for whatever reason, even though you're not a monk, I mean, there are the, the five tonics, which is sugar, butter, oil, clarified butter or ghee, and uh, honey. So you can make up some kind of like pudding -y stuff. In, in Burma, it's called sedumadu which is like a mixture of four of these five ingredients. And uh, you can eat it with a spoon. I mean, you could eat hard candy. You could uh, drink stuff. I mean, if you're not a monk, I mean, you could even drink milk in the afternoon. So it may, and also just maybe experiment with just drinking more water in, in the evening. 
And if you still get headaches, um, I'm not exactly sure what would cause, I mean, how would an empty stomach cause a headache? I, I, I've never experienced that before. At least I don't remember experiencing it. So yeah, it could be that you're just being dehydrated or something and that may cause a headache. Otherwise, uh, gosh. Yeah, I mean, if you get insomnia or something, you might tr take your one meal a day later in the day. And you would not necessarily, you wouldn't take it at dawn. If you're not a monk, it's not even necessary to eat it in the morning. So I guess I kind of answered that question. So I'm just going to move on to seal of action. Sipat Zidinao's next question, which is, what is the Mahayana understanding of mindfulness? And I would assume the Mahayana understanding of mindfulness is essentially the same as the Theravada understanding of mindfulness. I haven't, I don't recall reading any Mahayana sutras discussing a special Mahayana mindfulness. And I mean, Mahayana Buddhism accepted the basics from the older schools, including Theravada, and then pretty much added to it. But the basics have remained pretty much the same. And so I would assume, I'm just guessing here, but I would assume that the Mahayana understanding of mindfulness is pretty close, if not identical, to the Theravada understanding of mindfulness. Although there are some Mahayana Buddhists on the Discord server that might be able to answer that question more learnedly than I can, because I'm no expert on Mahayana, the Mahayana understanding of mindfulness. So I'll just move on to Seal of Action Sipat Zirina's next question, which is, will you ever do more videos outside? You have older Q&A videos where we can see your backyard, for example, and it made the video more pleasant to watch. And I'm sure my, my woman is, is very happy to hear this because she's always wanting me to do videos outside. Like we go someplace scenic, especially. We go to a lake or something. She, often at the last minute, she'll say, would you do like a five or 10 minute video? And it's like, I haven't prepared anything. And, you know, I'm, I'm more inclined in recreation than, or than doing a video or something. And so it usually doesn't happen. Also, we have moved into a different house that does not have nearly as scenic of a backyard as uh, our previous residence. But uh, yeah, I think uh, there is a good chance that I will be doing more videos outside in the outdoors. So, yeah, I, I just assume that guys don't care. You know, it's like I'm, I'm told, you know, I need to trim my beard before I do the video or I need to comb my hair better or wear a different shirt or, you know, you should have different backgrounds sometimes just to liven things up and add some variety. And I'm thinking most of the people who watch these videos are guys. They don't care about that kind of stuff. And here we got CEO and Sipad Zidana of all people saying that he wants more scenic backgrounds. I could do like Brian Rue and just put like the virtual Grand Canyon or, or whatever behind me. But uh, I never, I guess the, the virtual backgrounds are getting better. I remember when Brian Rue started using these virtual backgrounds, like the shape of his head would keep changing and his, his ears would appear and disappear. And it was weird, but it's getting better now. So, but I figure backgrounds don't really matter. I mean, I've never really been interested in that sort of thing. It's like one of my role models with regard to doing videos on YouTube is Styx Hexenhammer, who just sits in front of the same background every time, just does, does it all in one take. You know, he's not reading anything. That I think that's a good method. I, I respect that method much more than, than some people who have like special backgrounds and they're doing all these, these jump cuts it might take, like, you can see that there, there's like three editorial cuts in the middle of one sentence sometimes. Well, two anyway. I just, it's just too much work. And I just, I just figured people don't even care. Because I don't care. But now you've got an ally. Seal of Action, Sipad Zidana has an ally in, in my mate who uh, can now <clears throat> use that as leverage to get me to do more videos outside. And so I'm just gonna move on to the next question. This is from Romeo. And Romeo says, I am a fairly recent explorer of Buddhism and attend weekly meditation and Dharma discussion at a local Theravada Buddhist temple. Last week, our topic was the nine qualities of the Buddha. 
I was taken aback when the Buddhist monk leading the talk began speaking about how the Buddha had supernatural powers, including teleportation, walking on water, walking through walls, becoming invisible, levitating, telepathy, miraculous healing, and making clones of himself. I have always been turned off by having to make such leaps of faith into supernatural phenomenon. It's phenomena. The plural of phenomenon is phenomena. So I'll, I'll just back up a little here. I have always been turned off by having to make such leaps of faith into supernatural phenomena in other religions and felt some disappointment to discover that Buddhism was like them in this regard. If I am correct, you studied one of the sciences in college. I am interested in hearing about your journey from studying the grounded rationality of Western science to becoming a Buddhist, which includes belief in the above-mentioned supernatural phenomena. He has phenomenon here again. Phenomena. Do you have any tips on how to reconcile these two polar opposite worldviews for an aspiring Western Buddhist? Well, there's a lot to unpack here if I choose to unpack it, because the actual question is right down here at the bottom, which is, do you have any tips on how to reconcile these two polar opposite worldviews for an aspiring Western Buddhist? And they're really not polar opposite worldviews, unless you're a scientific materialist, which most Western Buddhists are, because most Westerners are. So, I mean, the main tip on how to reconcile the, the possibility of paranormal activity with science would be to read a parapsychology book. That would be a good intro. That would, that would be a foot in the door, if you will. Yeah, so read a good book on parapsychology, which tries to study paranormal phenomena scientifically. So that would be a good idea. Or even like Carl Jung's essay on synchronicity, something like that. It wouldn't be as good as a really good parapsychology book, though. You can read all about like poltergeist phenomena and, and like making predictions and like, like telling cards that you can't see, remote viewing. I mean, it's all been scientifically studied and it's pretty much been verified that it really does exist to some degree. So let's see. Buddha had supernatural powers, including teleportation. Well, Neem Karoli Baba, whose picture is up there on the altar, yeah, he could, according to testimonies, he could just cease to exist in one place and appear somewhere else, or he could appear in more than one place simultaneously. Walking on water, walking through walls, becoming invisible, levitating, telepathy. Yeah, well, telepathy, I mean, yeah, he could do that too. I don't recall any stories of him <clears throat> walking on water, but if he if you stood before him, he would know you better than you know you. So let's see. Always been turned off by having to make such leaps of faith, although you definitely leaped into the faith of scientific materialism, it seems. And scientific materialism really is a faith-based belief system. I've written numerous essays on that subject. I think... Uh, some of them are, are in the books I've written that, that are available on Amazon. So let's see. So let's, let's scroll down a little farther here. See, if I am correct, you studied one of the sciences in college. Yeah, I, I majored in marine biology and minored in chemistry. So I am interested in hearing what your journey from studying the grounded rationality of Western science to becoming a Buddhist which includes belief in the above-mentioned supernatural phenomenon, he says. Well, I mean, before I got a degree in marine biology, I mean, I was the son of my father who was um, an avid pioneer in the occult, that he enjoyed um, exploring frontiers, including the frontier of his own mind. And so he, he ran a coven of witches for a while. He did seances. He did a lot of experiments with ESP. And we did have a poltergeist in our house. And, and so I had a, a father who was pretty much of a, a, a warlock. And so that was before I took biology. 
And uh, I would not say that anything is really grounded rationality. I mean, everything is based on irrationality. There is no purely rational attitude because, I mean, you have to have an infinite regress to avoid ultimately basing your premises on some irrationally chosen information. Some guess. So, yeah, I mean, the main answer to the question, do you have any tips on how to reconcile these two allegedly polar opposite worldviews? For an aspiring Western Buddhist, read a book on parapsychology, which actually tries to study the paranormal in a scientific manner. And some, some of the, the stuff that parapsychologists have come up with are so mind-blowing that it just causes hysteria from the scientific materialists. That they'll say, they've got to be cheating somehow. We don't know how they're cheating. It looks pretty ironclad. You know, it's like an airtight experimental design. But still, they got to be lying. they got to be cheating somehow because it's just, we just cannot cope with this. So, I mean, like Helmut Schmidt, who worked for Boeing Laboratories, he, he asked for permission on how to, he asked for permission that, to study um, the effect of consciousness on physical systems. And he was granted permission. He came up with some mind-blowing stuff. But, I mean, mainly it's just the belief that this stuff is impossible is what is largely causing it to be seemingly impossible. So we've just kind of locked ourselves into a kind of spiritually bankrupt materialism that is not the natural state. And like somebody like Rene Guenon, he's, he's saying that, I mean, eventually it's going to have to come crashing down. That we have like this shell around us of what we consider to be reality that's just like forbidding any kind of divinity, for example, from influencing us. Or at least it's doing a lot to reduce the amount of divinity influencing us because we just believe that it doesn't exist. It's impossible. And it's like this hardened shell we've got around us. And sooner or later, when civilization degenerates enough, the stability of our culturally conditioned shell is going to break down enough that it's going to start getting cracks in it and will eventually shatter. But that's Rene Guénon. You don't have to believe that. So, I'll just move on to Romeo's next question, which is, what is your opinion of Alex Jones? Man, we're getting, some, we're getting some really interesting questions sometimes here. What is your opinion of Alex Jones? Do you feel his views about a nefarious, secretive international elite controlling the affairs of the U.S. and other parts of the world are accurate, or do you write him off as a nutty conspiracy theorist like so many others do? Well, I don't watch Alex Jones nearly as much as my sweetheart, my blushing bride does. Um, she might be better, better equipped to answer this question, but it does seem, first of all, Alex Jones is kind of conspiratorial in his thinking, much like my friend Brian Rue. Um, you know, it's never, he, I mean, he rarely passes up a good conspiracy theory. And a lot of conspiracy theories are true. And a lot of conspiracy theories are just mainstream, like the whole Russia collusion hoax with, with Donald Trump. I mean, that was a conspiracy theory that was bullshit and it was believed in by half the country. So let's see, getting back to Alex Jones though, I think he's sort of a combination of, I mean, overly credulous in some degree. I mean, just like, loving conspiracy theories just a little too much, but nevertheless, he has made a lot of accurate predictions and he's not nearly as nutty as a lot of people would prefer to believe him to be. So I can see him, in a way, I kind of see him like a, like a, some kind of psychic or spirit medium, which, I mean, they got like a trickster element to them so that they do have genuine talent, but also they play tricks. You know, they, they'll like fool you to some degree or just, you know, they'll be fakes to some degree or like charlatans to some degree, but still nevertheless have genuine talent. And I think Alex Jones is kind of along the same lines, um, but I don't think he's nearly as nutty as people think that he is. A lot of normies think that he is. 
And a lot of it is just sort of stagecraft. You know, a lot of the time he'll be just like ranting and running around with his shirt off and stuff that, I mean, is in a way it's kind of like clickbait. So, but I mean, definitely his views about a nefarious secretive international elite controlling the affairs of the U.S. I mean, that's not even secret anymore. I mean, all you got to do is just look at the news with your eyes open and you can see that there really is like the billionaire elite, the globalist ruling elite kind of that, you know, <clears throat> this one reason why they hate Trump so so hysterically and rapidly is he he's much more difficult to control. I mean, it used to be before Trump that voting for a U.S. president was like choosing between Coke and Pepsi. I mean, it was didn't really matter all that much because it was the same donor class, the same elites had the same influence on, on either side. But when Trump sort of steered the Republican Party away from globalism, the globalist elite didn't like that at all. And it's, I mean, the rest is history. I mean, he's just been like attacked relentlessly ever since. So getting back to Alex Jones, though, yeah, I guess I answered that question. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is a really easy question to answer. This is from Drunk Druck, and he asked this question a few days ago, and I assume that it's too late for me to advise him on this. He says, should I drink the bottle of 175 proof whiskey I found in my cousin's pantry? I'm concerned I'll get completely shit hammered instantly, but I don't want to disappoint my cousins. Well, obviously, from a Buddhist point of view, don't get slammed. And I've never even heard of 175 proof whiskey. I, I'm skeptical that there is such a thing as 175 proof whiskey. I mean, you're getting almost, I mean, you're getting almost into pure grain alcohol at that point. Even most like, like super, super rum isn't 175 proof. So yeah, this could be like an imaginary bottle of, of whiskey. Maybe it's just 75 proof, which would be weaker than average whiskey. I think the average bottle of whiskey is like 80 proof or 40% alcohol. So yeah, you don't want to uh, steal anything and, and getting slammed on whiskey, regardless of the proof, is also a non-dharmic activity. So yeah, I would, I would advise you against it. But since you asked the question days ago, it might have already come to pass. So I'm just going to move on to this question. This is from Rui. And Rui says, being a follower of the Buddha teachings is certainly not a political affiliation, but do you think it could at least be a political stance? Well, I mean, with regard to like hardcore Buddhism, you renounce society. You know, if you're, if you're a Buddhist heavy hitter, you renounce society, at least from the Theravadan point of view. And even talking about politics is called animal talk. And monks are discouraged from even talking about politics. Excuse me. Ah, it's going, I'm going with the emergency backup beverage now. The pond water awaits. So, um, but I mean, Buddhism as a social, like a popular religion, where most of the followers of Buddhism are no longer like veteran ascetics living in Indian forests, that, uh, yeah, you can have like a Buddhist political party, much as you have Christian political parties or Muslim political parties, um, <clears throat> which would be a political party that has some non-Buddhist, you know, some positions that are irrelevant to Dharma and then other positions, just like an ethical position, like, you know, pacifism, for example, or, you know, just honesty in government, kind of a pipe dream there. But I mean, still, you could at least like have a movement endorsing that. So, yeah, I mean, you can incorporate Buddhism into a political party or into a political affiliation or, or a political stance. But um, I think you'd always have to have some non-Buddhist ideas. Like with regard to economics, I mean, Buddhism really doesn't say much about economics. So the whole economic platform would, I mean, you could use Buddhist philosophy to support 
your decision, but somebody on the opposite side could be using Buddhist philosophy to support their position also. So, I mean, a right winger could, could use Buddhist philosophy to you know, support certain decisions. And then a left winger might be using the same Buddhist philosophy or just different texts, different statements in different texts to support the exact opposite point of view. So, yeah, I mean, let's see, I'll have to ask the question again here. Being a follower of the Buddhist teachings is certainly not a political affiliation, but do you think it could at least be a political stance? It could be an aspect of a political stance, um, or it could be that you have a political stance that, for example, does not include economics, for example, or not, not a very advanced kind of economics. But I mean, to some degree, you have to have like violations of Dharma in order to have uh, an effectively run political state. You know, you have to punish criminals, for example. You may have to fight wars, you know, at least wars of self-defense. You may have to do things that are not good Dhamma, um, just as a political necessity and reality. So I think the best you could do is just, which has already been done, is just have a political party that endorses certain Buddhist values and endorses Buddhism, but really has to add a lot of non-Buddhist stuff in order to round it out as any kind of political point of view. Because again, politics is really not very Buddhist and monks are forbidden or it says in the text a good monk just doesn't talk about politics talk about kings and ministers and wars and so forth it's all it's all under the rubric of animal talk so yeah that is kind of a subtle question though i know you probably write an entire book answering that question which i really don't want to do so i'm just going to move on to the next question this is from cleefy and Cleefe says, looking at today's political world, ooh, another politics question, looking at today's political world, are we witnessing hell entities taking over this realm? If we are, how do we protect ourselves from them? Well, anyone who would think this, I mean, I'm not trying to badmouth Cleefe, but anyone who, who could have this attitude probably hasn't read a whole lot of history because this, this shit has been going on since there have been governments, since there have been politics, you've got corrupt, just even genocidal, sociopathic politics going on. You know, re read the history of the, like the Roman Empire or like the Italian Renaissance, the shit that was going on in Italy during the Renaissance, or even like medieval England or, or just pretty much any, any kind of political history. Uh, I mean, the, the 20th century, even though it did have a lot of bad stuff going on, like Marxism and Pol Pot and, you know, the whole World War II thing, World War I before that, but still, I mean, modern times have been relatively tame compared to how politics used to be. I mean, we've got a constitutional republic in America, even though the Constitution is being ignored more and more, especially by one party who is accusing the other party of doing it. But I mean, it used to be, you just have like Roman emperors who, it was like power would just go to their head and they'd become like sociopaths, a lot of them. And then human rights, that's like a modern invention. So yeah, I think it's always been, it's always been messed up. It's always been a shit show. And with few exceptions, I mean, the exception, I mean, when it hasn't been a shit show, that's the exception to the rule. So it's not so much hell entities. I mean, there, there probably are like malevolent beings, like not human, you know, like malevolent inhuman forces that are influencing politics and so forth. I mean, that is to be expected, I think, as long as you're not a scientific materialist who just thinks that's all bullshit and impossible. So, I mean, but it's always been going on. It's just that as things get bigger, as governments and powers get more big and powerful, then you're going to have bigger, more powerful entities meddling in it. 
And uh, fortunately, I would like to believe anyway that not all of these entities are malevolent, that you're going to have benevolent ones too. So the angels and the devils are uh, <clears throat> at war, so to speak. And I'm just going to move on to the next question. This is from the Proto Pseudo Monk. And he says, In the past Q&A, you mentioned you stopped making progress in the Dhamma. Can you define progress? And how can you know if you are or aren't progressing? That may seem like being stuck. May, no, what may seem like being stuck may in fact be on steadfast track to Nibbana. I never understood how you could gauge progress. Are there enlightenment metrics? Well... One way is, I mean, you get to a certain stage of meditation, like get into like a really refined, subtle state of consciousness where you're no longer thinking. Your mind is just clear like glass or like a, like a mirror, just reflecting whatever is, is coming at you and just not like singling anything out, you know, not focusing on one thing to the in ignoring everything else, not having any kind of running commentary, just wide awake and just your mind is clear and then then for years after that you just can't get that again you know it's just you 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 not only aren't making progress but you're not even your meditation isn't as good as it was previously and like if you are making progress sometimes you'll get into like this stage that you're not used to and then it's like you're feeling pt like sometimes your whole body is just like twitching with with energy, you know, and there's just this exhilaration of experiencing this new mental state. It's like a new, uh, like a, um, a new dimension has opened up. And then eventually you just get used to that and it just becomes, you know, this kind of commonplace practically. And then you just, if you're not making progress, you're just not breaking new ground. You know, you're just kind of treading water. And uh, like I said, like a few moments ago, it's like, it may be that you got into these states that were just like mystical states that then you just can't get into them again. You know, it's like you're doing pretty well for a while and then you just kind of backslide back into the kind of the, the mental state or the, the meditative states that you had before that and you just never get back up into that, those higher realms. Or if you do, it's just like this glimmer. It's not something you can do consistently. And, you know, it's <clears throat> um, like Godika in the Godika Sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya. I mean, you know, he was with Jhana. He'd get Jhana and then lose it and then get Jhana and then lose it and get Jhana and then lose it. And then finally, in desperation, he just commits suicide. So, I mean, if you get into refined meditative states, you know it. I mean, you know what it's like. And then for years afterwards, you just can't get anything really close to that other than just a few little glimmers then obviously that's it's a pretty good indication that you're not making progress it's not even that you got used to it so it's no longer exhilarating you know it just becomes standard you know it's, it's not even that much so i mean it is true like saint john of the cross says that just spiritual aridity the dark night of the soul does mean that you're getting close but yeah, I mean, after like eight or 10 years of still not making progress, like real progress, I mean, you're making progress at other levels, you know, you're gaining experience and, and just, you know, absorbing things like subliminally and so forth that is still making progress. But with regard to like the, the technical realm of doing certain kinds of meditation, then it's pretty, pretty easy to, to know whether you're making progress or not. Like for a beginner, just your mind straying away less, you know, just keeping your mind on the, the primary object of meditation longer. You know, it's like when you first start, you might be lucky to, to have 20% of the time that you're sitting actually on the, the primary object of meditation. If you get better at meditation, it might be 50%. And then finally, you might be up like 90%. I don't know if anybody gets to 100.0% other than you know, some sort of heavy hitter swami or something. So, I mean, it's, I mean, just that, just for a beginner, just what percentage of the time are you actually meditating and what percentage of the time are you just thinking about what you want to have for dinner? 
and then you get like into more advanced meditation it's like how how what percentage of the time are are you just sitting there in a state of like a mystical state you're not thinking you're just wide awake wide awake and not thinking anything i mean what percentage of your of your hour of sitting for example are you in that state if if the percentage is going down then you're sort of retrogressing if the, the percentage is, is increasing then you are progressing so it's pretty straightforward actually it seems to me but of course there are all sorts of other factors so it can be somewhat complicated but still you get an overall feeling of whether you are making progress or whether you are retrogressing or whether you're just kind of stagnating and just staying in, in the same place and it's not necessarily a bad thing if if you're just staying in the same place i mean just because you're not making progress it's not necessarily bad it may be that if you're meditating just for the sake of stress reduction just to help you relax so that you sleep good that night or you know just just to remind you on a daily basis that this circus of samsara really um i mean you can transcend that then yeah i mean you can just sit and do the same meditation, you know, night after night and not make progress and not retrogress. It's just this, this zone you get into and it's a comfortable zone and it's good for you and you like it. That's fine. But if you're trying to become enlightened, you know, I mean, that requires progress. You can't just stop, you know, improving. And I mean, once you're enlightened, then you don't need to improve anymore. But, I mean, if you aren't enlightened yet or you, you feel like you still need to improve, then if you stop improving, it, it can be pretty obvious. Especially if you're in, like, mindful enough and, you know, you, you've got a good enough feel for meditative states so you can actually see, like, the subtleties of your own, your own mind going on. But I think I need to move on to the next question. Also from the proto pseudo monk, and he says, "Can the voice of Venerable Panyobasa lead to jhana? For example, while listening to a mind blowing Q and A. Well, if you're listening to the words, then you wouldn't get past first jhana. Probably not even first jhana, because I mean, even if you're in first jhana, you're not going to be thinking in sentences. You might be doing a mantra or breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. You might get first jhana still using that much." like verbal thinking, but <clears throat> listening to a discourse as a kind of meditation, yeah, you're not going to get jhana for that. Although if you're just doing mindfulness of hearing, you're just hearing, 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 you could probably get into some, some jhana from that. Although you wouldn't really be listening to the meaning of the words. It would just be like auditory feeling. Just the sensory data impinging on your eardrums, so to speak. So, yeah, but listening to a mind-blowing q and I mean, possibly it could be a Zen kind of Satori kind of a deal where you just get your mind blown by some sort of koan-like paradox that just slams you out of a an intellectual rut. And then you might have some kind of like a spontaneous experience, but while you're having the, this, this experience, you probably wouldn't be thinking in words anymore. It could be that the words will just sort of shove you over this cliff edge or whatever. But then uh, <clears throat> once, you, once you're, you're falling off the cliff, then you're not going to be really listening to the words anymore. It's just going to be, you're going to be in your own experience, you know, just dealing with whatever, is, whatever has, has been triggered. So, I think I'll just move on to uh, <clears throat> Proto Pseudo Monk's next question. What are the Buddhist ethics on investing? I am thinking about learning about the financial markets and investing, but I am concerned this may be undharmic. What isn't clear is if this activity done with mindfulness, big if, can be devoid of greed, karmically neutral, or if greed is inherent to investing which is akin to gambling. It is no small decision as it will require quite a lot of time to learn about. Of course, 
If fortunes were made, I would play the role of the eccentric Buddhist millionaire supporting Dhamma centers in the West. Well, yeah, I think that this is sort of a, a gray zone in Buddhist ethics because gambling is considered to be unethical, undharmic. And like playing the stock market really is a kind of gambling, it seems to me. But any kind of investing, like a farmer is investing his labor and some of his money to grow his crops. And I mean, that's just necessary for existence. That's the curse of Adam. You know, you got to invest something. At least you're investing your time and labor in, in an attempt to make money so that you can feed yourself and your family and pay your bills and so forth. So, I mean, it kind of reminds me of, uh, I mean, maybe I shouldn't mention this, but it kind of reminds me of Adolf Hitler or Adolf Hitler, as uh, some people will re keep reminding me that uh, he was very much against like the capitalist class of people who are making money without actually working. You know, they're just making money off other people working. And he considered that to be unethical. And people might scoff at Hitler thinking something is unethical. But really, in a way, he did have certain ethics. Like he was against animal cruelty. Some of the first laws against animal cruelty were passed by the German National Socialists back in the 1930s. The first rules against smoking in public places. Things that now is, is just considered common sense. I mean, so... I'm not exactly sure where I was going with that, but uh, yeah, it could be that, uh, I mean, you have to invest something really if it's, it's your money and like you're starting a new business or something in a way that's an investment and in a way it's kind of a gamble because a lot of new businesses just don't succeed. So I do think that there is certainly a gray zone, although it does seem to me that uh, um, like investing in the stock market is, is kind of like playing blackjack at a casino. I mean, you can learn certain rules that will maximize your odds of winning. But still, in a, in a way, it is gambling. But it is a truism that life is a gamble. So, yeah, it is. I mean, it's one of those things that... Uh, I mean, Buddhism, I mean, really investing in stock markets and so forth, commodities, markets, bonds. I mean, it just didn't really exist in the Buddhist time. I mean, a money economy was just really getting started up in the Buddhist time in India. And you did have like money lenders. You had rich bankers. Anatta Pindika was apparently some kind of business tycoon or banker. And I mean, he, he was an Arya, according to the texts. So, I mean, it's not all bad. And mainly, I guess what it all boils down to is your own, your own mental states. Because an outward action is neither good or bad. I mean, it's any kind of outward action. Just the mere physical outward action of it is morally neutral. And so, I mean, if you're doing it as a way of making money to live, paying your bills and all that, you know, you don't have any more negative mental states than if you were, say, working at a grocery store. Then, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be any worse than working at a grocery store. It depends on your own mental states. So, I mean, if you're doing it without a lot of attachment and a lot of greed and so forth, then it might not be any worse than working in a grocery store or a sheet metal shop. So... Yeah, I guess I answered that question. So I'm just going to move on to the next question, which is from Yuga U. And we've been going at this for over two and a half hours. <clears throat> I just amazed myself by my capacity to just babble endlessly. So Yuga U says, please talk about make mindfulness and your opinion about it. There are negative case studies that it only worsens psychological well-being of people who practice it. It's my opinion that they are selling people a car without brakes and safety belt. Well, negative case studies that it only worsens psychological well-being of people who practice it. I'm not exactly sure what he necessarily means with mindfulness other than just the kind of 
superficial, casual kind of mindfulness meditation that is taught in a lot of Dharma halls in the West and to some degree in the East also. Um, you know, it's sort of like meditation and mindfulness without any other kind of Buddhist, you know, five precepts that's totally optional and just like any kind of knowledge of actual Buddhist philosophy and, and like how ethics works and so forth. You know, looking into and seriously considering it to be true, the Four Noble Truths, instead of just kind of doing it as an intellectual exercise, just, you know, the way uh, some academic scholar would study some text without, you know, bothering to consider maybe it's really true or not. So, yeah, I think in for the most case, you know, it's not going to cause psychological harm to most people. There's always going to be some people who get messed up. There's some people that they're just so unmindful that forcing themselves to be mindful is just sort of a traumatic experience and can cause something to snap. Anybody who's been to a lot of meditation retreats knows every once in a while, somebody will just snap. You know, it's, it's like, it's just so unnatural. Like at a Mahasi, Mahasi retreat where everyone's moving in slow motion and you're not supposed to talk to people. It's almost like being in a Chinese thought reform camp you know, it's like you're only allowed to talk to one person and that's the teacher and you know, minimum sleep, minimum food, and you're just doing this relatively mindless activity. And, you know, there, there are a lot of similarities between an intensive meditation retreat and a thought reform camp. And some people, I mean, it's the whole point at the thought reform camp that the people snap because once they snap, then, you know, it's like the, the political agent or whatever the commissar or whoever it is you know then they come in and just reprogram you so at least in a meditation retreat if that happens you've got a relatively benevolent relatively wise person who's helping you to restructure your personality so yeah i mean some people they're just uh you know, they just want the, the fine control knob of meditation without really bothering with most of Buddhist ethics and philosophy and just just meditation without the morality and some some fairly good understanding of what Buddhism teaches that, I mean, it could be, I mean, you're going to get some kind of benefit from it, even if you get some harm from it, too. You know, you're at least facing your own monkey mind and realizing that you do indeed have a monkey mind. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it just doesn't go far enough. What I consider to be mindfulness is just kind of shallow and casual. And most people do it just because it, it helps them to feel better. You know, they're not doing it to wake up. They're doing it just to sleep more comfortably. And I mean, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, mindfulness is a stress relief technique. It's, it's certainly sort of perverting something with a very exalted purpose into something much less exalted. But still, I mean, it's not just like evil or anything. So, yeah, the negative case studies, I assume, is people that really can't appreciate Dhamma for the most part that are, that are doing these studies and they have a, like a predetermined desire for, for the outcome of it. <sighs> but my opinion about being mindful isn't so much that it's, it's like harming people. It's just that it's, it's being, like, like I already said, it's just sort of perverted into something that it wasn't intended to be. And, you know, instead of helping people to wake up, for the most part, it just helps them to sleep more comfortably. So I'm just going to move on to Yuga U's next question, which is, please talk about magical powers that Buddha and his disciples apparently showed during their lives in today would de devoid of miracles. I think maybe he's meant in today's world, devoid of miracles. It's hard to believe they happened. Yeah, well, this is very similar to a question I've already addressed um, with regard to Buddha having psychic powers and his 
his enlightened disciples and even highly advanced disciples having psychic powers. Um, yeah, I think part of the reason is that people are so locked into scientific materialism that they think that that like paranormal events just can't happen anymore. And it's their their belief that it's impossible helps it to be impossible. That I do think that in pre-modern societies, the paranormal was much more common than it is in like New York City. 21st century New York City. So I do think that the Buddha did have psychic abilities that would be considered impossible by most Western Buddhists. And I don't know. I mean, like I, like I mentioned, my father was definitely an experimenter in the occult, as he called it, you know, the paranormal, as it's more commonly called nowadays. And I have seen uh, fairly good evidence, including scientific evidence, like in parapsychology books, books by Ian, Dr. Ian Stevenson, uh, also with regard to reincarnation or rebirth. That, uh, And also, <clears throat> I have read The Trickster and the Paranormal, which gives a very elegant explanation of how the paranormal works. So, yeah, I've got no problem with, with people having psychic powers. They, it's mainly of two kinds, maybe more than two kinds, where you've got like the, the very wise person who is just sort of detaching from the rules that almost everybody has to follow. And then you've got like people like witches who have other ways of sort of like, in a way, uh, like imitating the, the, the mental states of a wiser person, at least temporarily. In order, to, in order to accomplish certain things. I don't know how clearly I'm explaining that right now. It doesn't, it's, not, it's not sounding very clear to me, <laughs> what I just said just now. But um, <clears throat> I do think that the paranormal is just a part of existence that nowadays Western educated people who adopt scientific materialism as their faith just believe it's impossible, which helps it to be impossible at least relatively impossible. It's, it's like much less common now, even though it, there's no way to completely eradicate it. Because that's sort of like the chaotic element of existence. You get rid of all the chaos, you just got this dead determinism. So, I guess, I mean, I've already talked about this in a, in a question above, and we're going, we're heading towards three hours again. So I'm just gonna move on to the next question, which is from Extremely Rare Bird. An extremely rare bird says, in Christianity, there is emphasis on taking care of the unfortunate, the sick and needy, or somehow disabled. From what I have gathered from Buddhism is that it's commendable to do so, but that monks are not supposed to take care of others, not just any common people anyway. They're supposed to focus on getting enlightened instead. Why do you think this is, apart from obvious reason that monks can't own anything, therefore can't give anything away? Well, I would say that monks definitely are strongly encouraged in the texts to take care of sick monks. You know, to the, the Sangha is a, like brothers and they should all take care of each other. And if one of them gets sick, I mean, it's very commendable. And the Buddha definitely endorsed it that at least one other monk should be taking care of him. And, you know, if he, if he doesn't get better, then the monk who's been taking care of him inherits his robe and bowl his robes and bowl. And um, so, I mean, with regard to that, just internally, the Sangha is definitely supposed to take care of the sick and needy. It's like a mutual support system going on there. Of course, monks are forbidden to do any kind of medical treatment of like ordinary lay people, other than maybe their own parents. So, yeah, it's like the purpose of Buddhism is to become enlightened, which involves just radical renunciation. You just opt out of society. Society is always going to be fucked up. Samsara is always going to be broken. You're never going to be able to fix samsara. And so from the ancient Indian point of view, you just opt out. You bail out. 
which might be seen as cowardice or whatever, but that's like saying somebody who doesn't escape from a burning building but decides to stay in the burning building to apply first aid to the burn victims is doing something better than the person who gets out of the building, finds out how to get out of the building, and then maybe comes back in to help other people get out. But first, you've got to find your way out of the building before you can help anybody else get out of that building. you got to know how to get out yourself. So some people in the modern West might think it's more noble to just stay in the burning building, possibly burn to death in the process. But before you burn to death, you're applying first aid to the burn victims who are also going to burn to death. So let's see. I guess I answered that question. <laughs> that was almost a rant there. I'm glad that I can still work myself up into a semi rant after well over two and a half hours of talking. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be nice if I did like a whole three hour long video, just nonstop ranting, man, that would be glorious. Let's see here. So I guess I answered that question. And so I'm just going to move on to extremely rare birds. Next question regarding Neem Karoli Baba. So he says, regarding Neem Karoli Baba and his blessings, there are, these, there are stories of him basically granting people's wishes of having children, success, etc. In one story, he said to a couple to buy him 10 bags of flour so that they may have a son. And, and then they did have a son. Another story involves him putting his feet on a man's head, and supposedly this helped his life situation. As you know, there are many other stories like this, What's your take on these types of blessings? Is it magic or perhaps thanks to an intricate understanding of karma or what? Well, it's, it's not really magic unless you consider anything paranormal to be magic. You know, it's not like a magician's trick or like what a witch does. It's just that he was so advanced, so detached from samsara that stuff that's supposedly impossible would just spontaneously keep happening around. I don't think that he deliberately decided to perform some miracle. It just flowed through him. Largely, it was being elicited from the karma of the people around him. Like Ram Das used to say, the better you knew Neem Karoli Baba Maharaji, the more you realized there was really nobody there. He was just like a mirror reflecting your own karma back at you. And so uh, this story about his putting his feet on a man's head, it reminds me of one story about Neem Karoli Baba about how Maharaji, Neem Karoli Baba, took one of his, his disciples and says, we've got to go visit somebody. There's this man who's dying and he he's like keeps thinking about me. So I got to go see him. So they just go through this slum, you know, like in, I don't know, whatever, whatever slum city in India they're going through. They're going through this slum and just go taking the circuitous route until he gets to this place. And there's a man lying there in his in his apartment or his house or his you know wherever he's staying and maharaji puts his foot on his head and then the guy dies it was like the man wanted you know to pay his respects to maharaji before he died it was troubling him that you know he wasn't able to pay his respects to his guru before he died and maharaji just picked up on that and just you know went out in search of this guy and just the man was humble. You know, he considered Maharaji to be much higher than him. You know, he considered Maharaji to be like an embodiment of God. And so Maharaji, I mean, it was just really what the man's karma needed. You know, it was like what he required spiritually was to have the foot of the guru on his head. And it's a lot of it is sort of cultural conditioning, conditioning what people would consider to be the most powerful thing or something that at least they can grasp, something they can get their head around. Like, you know, we want to have a kid, and the guru says, offer 10 bags of flour to the ashram, and then you'll have your baby. And then it's like their belief, you know, their faith in that. They, all right, we'll do it. And then they just believed it, and it, their faith, you know, like the grain, the grain of mustard seed, it just helped it to come to pass that they got what they wanted. So, I mean, it's, I'm not a materialist. <clears throat> I mean, scientific materialism, or at least scientific empiricism, definitely is powerful. It definitely has its place. 
but still it does not account for everything. And people who try to insist that it account for everything are just kind of blinding themselves. So let's see, what is the question here though? What's your take on these types of blessings? Yeah, I pretty much already gave my, my take on it in that in a way he's just reflecting their own karma back at them, including their own beliefs, their own expectations, and just what deep down would be required to really move them enough and give them enough faith that they really do, you know, get what they need. Um, and it's, it's not magic and it doesn't, it's not really an intricate understanding of karma necessarily either because Neem Karoli Baba, I mean, to some degree, there's really nobody there. So he's just in a way sort of like going with St. John of the Cross, where when you reach the stage of perfection, you cease to have your own self will. You just become an instrument of God. You become like a puppet of God. And it may be that Maharaji was like that, where he's not planning out anything. He's not saying, thinking to himself, I'm going to do this. You know, it just, it's just this spontaneous flow that he's, he's, he's in. And, you know, miracles would just spontaneously happen just, or just weird synchronicities, weird coincidences, that kind of thing. You know, they were much more likely to occur around somebody like him. So, okay, I guess I answered that question. And so I'm at the last question. I'm always taken by surprise. This is the very last question of this here particular Q&A. And it's from Nature Cure. And Nature Cure says, I guess you had a kapia in Burma. How did you find him? How was the relationship with him? Is it possible to be without a kapia in Burma as a bhikkhu? And for those of you who don't know what a kapia is, kapia is a word that's it's sort of like a slang term for monastery attendant. It's short for kapia karaka in Pali. Kapia literally means allowable, and karaka means maker of. So a kapia karaka or monastery attendant makes things allowable for the monks. So, for example, they'll make food allowable. A monk can't just help himself to food. It has to be given to him by someone who isn't a monk, or at least the food at some point has to be given to a monk from someone who isn't a monk. And so you've got the Kapia Karaka, who at a lot of monasteries, he'll be cooking the food for the monks. And some monasteries that have cars and roads, you know, they'll be driving the monks to this, to this and that place. And, you know, they'll be doing the stuff that monks aren't supposed to do, like mowing the lawn or just, you know, trimming the bushes, that kind of thing. And, uh, yeah, I did have a Kapia sometimes. I didn't have a Kapia at other times. Um, the main monastery I lived at, or the, the monastery I lived at longer than any other monastery was One Bo Wildlife Refuge Monastery, One Bo Baymet Do Jiao. And there was a copy of there. And unfortunately, I don't remember his name. But uh, he was like the nephew of another monk who lived there. And so <clears throat> he just would come, come and take care of his, his uncle, who was he's getting fairly old. And uh, so he had a big family, this monk at this monastery had like an extended family. He had like 50 grandkids. And so just, it was just sort of a family thing where they just, you know, sort of somebody volunteered in the family to go and check on their uncle every day. And he just did the stuff that, you know, he was also a good Buddhist. He was a devout Buddhist thinking that he was earning merit by being the, the attendant at the monastery. And so he just come in from the village like once a day and, you know, do what needed to be done. You know, clear the grass out of the, the main compound and, you know, whatever else needed to be done. He was a good guy. Um, I stayed at another monastery that went through a series of different copyists. You know, just people would, you know, you have devout Buddhists, usually an older man who <clears throat> just wants to earn merit. He goes to the monastery and just starts doing things around the monastery for the monks. You know, he's earning merit. You know, it's like a symbiotic relationship. It's a mutualism. You know, you've got the, 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 the attendant who volunteers to, to do things for the monastery to help the monks. He's earning merit. The monks are getting benefit from having somebody else mow the grass or whatever. It all works out fine. 
So, I mean, there were times when I was living alone out in the forest and there was no copy of. You know, I was just, I didn't even want to copy him. And I didn't have any grass to mow or anything like that. I just took my bowl and walked into, walked to the village and got my food and came back and ate it. And there would be, there would be people who would come and offer to do things for me. You know, there's, there's never any shortage of that in Burma. And I was like the exotic, foreign, very strict monk that people had a very high opinion of. So there was no shortage. In fact, the main problem was too many people wanting to do stuff for me. I mean, this one place I was living, they were poor people. I mean, they were like hillbillies. And so they couldn't really afford to offer me anything, which was fine because I didn't really want a lot of stuff. So they would just like, like fix my trail. You know, there was a trail from my cave to the village and they're just like turning it into this broad avenue. They're like chopping down trees and cutting branches and smoothing out rough places and everything. And I'm just keep telling them, stop it. Just stop fixing the trail. And it was just like this war of wills. So let's see, how do I get back to the question from here? How did I find him? Yeah, the copy of finds you just, I mean, I'm not like I'm comparing monastery attendants to dogs, but any, any monk in Burma is going to have a dog, whether he wants one or not, pretty much, unless he's living in a big city or something. But any forest monk, there's going to be dogs showing up, scroungy village dogs who are quite willing to eat your leftovers. And it's kind of a, a similar thing with, with monastery attendants. They just spontaneously appear of their own volition, wanting to earn merit. You know, they want to hang out with the monks. I mean, it's just a very common thing of, among religious people. I'm sure that uh, in Western countries at times or places where there was people had very deep faith, like the Burmese have in Buddhism, that you'd have people going to the the church or the the monastery or whatever and just offering to you know mow the lawn and trim the trim the hedges and you know maybe you know cook for the monks or whatever and everything was fine so so i found him just by uh just walking around the monastery and there he was and uh how was the relationship with him yeah the main one who was the nephew of the old monk um <clears throat> he lied a lot but for some reason, I could just forgive it really easily because it's sort of like this simple-minded, or I don't want to—I don't want to call him simple-minded, simple-hearted, sort of a childlike desire to please you by telling you what he thinks you want to hear, which is fairly common in certain cultures, where, like my father used to say, he he lived in Alaska for a long time, that in in the language of the Eskimos, which they were called back then. There is no word for lying, but all of them do it just because it's considered to be good manners to tell somebody what they want to hear, to tell them something that will please them. You know, it's just considered to be good manners. And he he was kind of like that, that, that monastery attendant was. I mean, I had one monastery attendant that, man, I mean, I think I've, I've done a video about this guy before. He was just a crook. I mean, he was just like stealing monastery property and selling it in town and pocketing the money and doing all this stuff. And finally I kicked him out of the monastery because he was such a, just an outrageous old crook. And then he went to the, <clears throat> the government, like the federal government of Burma and accused me of being a political agitator so that I was <laughs> under investigation by the, the Burmese secret police on political charges. Fortunately, they did a decent job. They did a responsible job and could tell easily enough that some monk living in a cave meditating out in a forest somewhere is not going to be much of a political agitator. But um, yeah, I mean, if, if anything, you, you have more of a, a problem on too many monastery attendants than, than not enough. And um, I guess I answered that question. So I answered all the questions. And so you guys know the drill by now, I assume, those of you who make it to the, the end of these videos, that if you have any questions that you think I might be able to answer regarding Buddhism, philosophy, monasticism, Burma, me personally, whatever, feel free to ask, although I don't know much about characters in video games because I really don't play very many of them. And uh, like and subscribe if you have not done so already, and be happy.